Hola, buenos días a todos. Eh, a nosotros como Sociedad de Periodoncia es un orgullo tenerlos a todos ustedes acá, especialmente un público tan joven, que era el objetivo de esta charla, porque eh, en el fondo nuestros alumnos son el futuro de la sociedad, entonces queremos que cada vez participen más, que sean parte de la sociedad y que empiecen a venir a nuestras reuniones y a empezar a planificar tal vez el futuro cuando nosotros ya dejemos de estar en esta sociedad. Así que muchas gracias por su asistencia. Eh, esta charla es un trabajo en conjunto entre la Sociedad de Periodoncia y la Fundación Apolonia. Entonces el tesorero de la Fundación Apolonia, Daniel Meyer, nos va a contar un poco eh, lo que es la Fundación Apolonia, en qué consiste y también cómo ustedes pueden participar en eso. Así que dejemos a Daniel Meyer para que pase. Ahora pasa la tía. Buenos días con, con todos. Eh, es eh, un gran placer para mí eh, de estar aquí con ustedes en representación de la Fundación Educacional de Polonia y su fundador y el presidente, doctor Jaime Charab, que eh, manda sus disculpas y cariñosos saludos, eh, que no puede estar eh, presente hoy día. Yo soy probablemente el único no odontólogo eh, de esa sala, más eh, del lado financiero, por eso me nombraron eh, tesorero eh, de, la, de la Fundación Apolonia. La Fundación Apolonia eh, Va a cumplir cinco años en septiembre, así estamos en, eh, en pre-kinder, como se dice a ti, ¿no? Eh, doctor eh, Jaime Charat eh, y su familia han iniciado esta, esta fundación eh, que tiene por ob objetivo el, continuo, el apoyo al continuo perfeccionamiento de la odontología eh, en Chile, a través de la capacidad capacitación y educación de los profesionales y con el fin de contribuir eh, a la salud dental eh, aquí en Chile. Tenemos, somos cinco directores, eh, pero creo que más importante eh, tenemos una red de consejeros internacionales eh, que incluye a Sofía Arcoa eh, de, de París, a Christoph Hemmele de, de Zurich, a Diego Velázquez de Michigan y a Richard, Richard Lazada. En nuestros pocos años de, de existencia, eh, hemos, aquí en Chile eh, estamos participando el, en el proyecto de la creación de un plan de salud nacional, de salud bucadental nacional eh, para adultos mayores, eh, un gran proyecto del CBO, liderado por su director eh, Jorge Gamonal. Ya estamos en el, creo que en el tercer año y bueno, eh, los avances son, son significativos. Nos enfocamos también al intercambio, a la colaboración con varias universidades a través del intercambio de profesionales con las facultades de odontología eh, de posgrado y bueno, la, la clínica odontológica eh, San Sebastián, pues, ¿no? que es del fundador y desarrollador del doctor okay. Jaime Charat. Teníamos eh, becados, vamos a recibir el cuarto becado de la Universidad de, de Zurich, de, de la clínica de odontología reconstructiva. Eh, teníamos el placer de poder eh, enviar dos eh, odontólogos a esa misma universidad. Eh, su directora Maite Suye tenía el placer de eh, estar dos eh, meses eh, en la Universidad de Michigan, en la School of Dentistry. District. And quizás eh, no es casualidad que justamente hoy eh, tenemos el honor de welcome eh, Dr. Al Chan from the University of Michigan. Uh, to uh, give you this uh, hopefully uh, very insightful and interesting speech. 
In that sense, I uh, pass on the, uh, the, the micro uh, to Michael Suyer uh, again, but we are at your disposal to uh, answer any questions about the Foundation. Mike is very familiar with, uh, with Apollonia, uh, so it would be great that we can also further cooperate uh, together. I wish you a very interesting morning. It's true to me, Charla de Alchan. Muchas gracias, Daniel, por esa introducción. Eh, y ahora yo les voy a presentar un poco el currículum del Dr. Chan. El Dr. Chan es, es originario de Taiwán y luego fue a hacer su posgrado de especialidad de periodoncia en la Universidad de Michigan, donde se tituló con el premio de excelencia que de un doctor en el fondo que todos debemos haber escuchado, el doctor Sigurd Ramfjord. Eh, y luego, en el fondo, se quedó trabajando en la Universidad de Michigan por mucho tiempo hasta ahora. Eh, es profesor asociado del programa de periodoncia de la Universidad de Michigan y hace ya unos años, en el fondo, hicieron un programa que, donde el doctor es el director que se llama PIMA, ¿ya? lo que significa Periodontal and Implant and Microsurgery Academy. Eh, eso, en el fondo, es donde fui yo a desarrollar un poco y aprender un poco de microcirugía. Las áreas de interés del doctor son especialmente la microcirugía y la cirugía regenerativa mínimamente invasiva. ¿ya? Además, es el principal investigador del equipo de ultrasonido oral de la Universidad de Michigan, donde son los pioneros a nivel mundial en esta herramienta. También es miembro del directorio de la Michigan Society of Periodontology, que es una de las sociedades de periodoncia más importantes de Estados Unidos, y ha publicado muchos artículos científicos y siempre su trabajo ha sido apoyado por el NIH y se ha ganado distintos premios a nivel internacional. Así que le damos la bienvenida a Dr. Chan. Thank you, Dr. Chan, for being with us. Good. Is that too long? Maybe too long. A little bit. Maybe down a little bit. The volume. Is it too long in the back? It's okay. Okay. We know the yes and the hola and the yo soy Albert Chen. Very glad to be here. That's the old Spanish I can speak. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's really my pleasure to be here uh, in Chile. My first time actually uh, in Southern America and uh, especially Chile. And uh, really appreciate for the uh, Dr. Suet uh, invitation and also the uh, Chilean Perio Society. And I see all the, the faces um, eager to learn. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's really glad to see you and uh, thank you for coming and uh, spend the uh, morning with me. And really hopefully I can give you a, a perspective of the new uh, insight into what we're thinking about Perio because Perio is, I mean, for me, is my passion and uh, really the, the beauty of combining the art and uh, the sciences as well. And as you know, I'm a practitioner and I see patients one day a week and using the microscope now for all my procedures. At the same time, I'm in a university as a researcher and as a teacher as well. So this combination is really enrich my life a lot and uh, part of the, the, the thing I like is to, um, to learn from the research that I do and from practice and uh, so as to share the knowledge uh, and the exchange put that way, exchange the knowledge that, uh, so that we can improve uh, our society and uh, benefit all our patients. So that's the really important thing here. Alrighty, so a little bit background myself. Uh, I was originally from Taiwan, 
and uh, they moved to Michigan uh, in the U.S. in 2008. And there I did my payroll training for three years. Uh, in 2011, I graduated from the program and then stay as a faculty now. Um, it's been uh, about 15 years in Michigan and uh, I'm very blessed and uh, fortunate to will be moved to uh, Ohio as a payroll chair there uh, in September 1st. So really looking forward uh, to this new position, new challenge for me so that I can really enhance research and also the microsurgical education. And also I want to invite all of you too, if you are interested in coming to the U.S. even for the short uh, visit or for longer term or even for residency, residency programs, trainings and uh, interesting practice in the future in the U.S., please uh, contact me so I can help you with that already. So, is, I was so excited and uh, taking the airplane and uh, from Atlanta here, I mean initially from uh, Michigan here and Detroit and uh, lay over at Atlanta and then took a long flight down to Chile, Santiago de Chile. So it's amazing. So this is a picture I took uh, in, the, in the airplane on the monitor here. And then um, I mean, it was very nice enough because one of the you know, reasons I would like to come to this country is really to ski. Uh, uh, I know the Andes, the mountains, great. And uh, in Michigan, it's flat. It's not much of the, uh, it's a little bit hill, but not much of the high mountains. So I talked to Dr. Charlotte that, that I would like to ski. And uh, uh, this is probably the only uh, time I can come and unfortunately, there's not much snow at this point yet. So yeah, so he booked a hotel at uh, uh, Malacoel. Malacoel, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, so I visit there and it's for three days before I came back to uh, Santiago. It's an amazing, beautiful place, very quiet, and there's a lot of natures that I like a lot. And uh, we visit a uh, volcano and this is the, I mean, everyone knows about the, the holy trees, uh, the, the Chile, Chilean pine trees. I mean, for me, it's amazing to see, the only can see here in Chile. You don't see this anywhere in the world. And there's little streams and beautiful, beautiful the sky and the, the color mixture with, uh, you know, forest, very thick. So very happy to, you know, enjoy, enjoy the nature here and also enjoy um, the discussions and uh, the sciences and the congress here. So now we move on to um, the topic here. I wanna, what I want to do is, yesterday I was in the uh, uh, course, the, the foundation where the, the clinic is, and they gave a lecture there. And I realized there's a lot of needs and a lot of interest into different types of procedures. For example, uh, soft tissue grafts procedures that uh, we all love as a periodontist, and also guided bone regeneration, and also periodontitis treatments. So if we look at all the, you know, the techniques, all the procedures that we, we do, what is important is really need to know um, the wound healing part of it, right? Because each time after we perform the procedure, what we're really interested in to, to see the outcome and how the patient feels at least. And also, what's that? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and uh, just want to know that the outcome that we're trying to achieve, right? Soft tissue and the treating um, periodontitis and the, the probing depth reduction, attachment level gain. And I see there's a lot of interest uh, in clinical cases and the discussion about why you do this, why not, and uh, the techniques. So what I'm going to do is I really reformat my presentation a lot and uh, try to tailor to uh, your needs. And also on the uh, in the audience, there's some like listen to the lecture yesterday as well. So I change a lot as well so that really if you have any needs, any questions, please let me know so that I can, you know, put my input into the presentation. 
And uh, as you know that uh, what I love about Perio now is there are two things now I do. One is the microsurgery because I, I learned from Dr. Diego Velasquez and uh, this is um, the technique, this is the you know, device that really opened my eyes, can certainly do a lot of things nowadays that we couldn't do. For example, saving the teeth that are uh, considered hopeless. And uh, this is uh, the beauty I love a lot. And uh, through this uh, technology, I learned a lot as well, doing research on it, uh, clinical research, look at the outcomes. And so these are the things I would love to share with you. Whether or not you will end up using the microscope, that's a different story. Even though I'm super biased that you should use microscope because I see better outcomes, more predictable outcomes, clinical outcomes with uh, using the microscope. Um, yeah, however, this is a tool that I really learn a lot from the biological point of view, from scientific point of view. And the second part is the uh, dental ultrasound. So this is another uh, development that we built uh, in the University of Michigan with my colleagues, Dr. Oliver Krifigan. So through the ultrasound, I don't expect you become an ultrasound specialist, or radiologist with ultrasound. However, I will try to explain to you in a very uh, easy way so that you can get an idea of how the ultrasound works and what the images tell you. But what is more important is I try to, I will try my best to have you to get to know how, you know, interpret the ultrasound images. How the images that mean to us in terms of analytical thinking or critical thinking so that we can really get to you know to improve our understanding of wound healing so eventually the key is to get predictable outcome so that's the key already so I give you a little bit of journey of how I learned the, the microsurgery so this is important too it is not something that I never done before and I introduced to you so this is really something I learned from the best and then I went through the process and I'm eager to share with you here. So the training back in 2016, I met Dr. Diego Velasquez and uh, he was a uh, part-time faculty in Michigan. And then he introduced the microsurgery to me and he learned microsurgery from Dr. Shanelik who was in uh, Santa Barbara, who was considered the father of a periodontal microsurgery. And um, unfortunately, he uh, passed away a few years ago, just before the COVID. So, but he left a legacy. He has a lot, he had a lot of pupils, students, and uh, learn from him and uh, start to spread uh, the microsurgery training, including Dr. Velasquez. So in 2016, I started to learn, I mean, working on uh, rubber dam and uh, working on sutures, how to place predictable sutures. Uh, this is important. And then in 2017, I really get interest into the micro. So I start to convince because I explained to you I had a one day practice a week in private practice. So I convinced my boss uh, to, to purchase the microscope so that I can start to you know, use, the, use the scope for the patients. So that's happened in 2017. And then 2018, once I get my hands wet and uh, get predictable outcomes, I start to train my residents uh, in Michigan now and the, to, to give them some hands-on practices over throughout the, you know, the, the year program. And uh, then in the clinic, in the clinic we have microscopes and whether it's on the floor or on the wall or on the mount, mounted on the ceilings and they start to you know, do some small procedures start from easy, from maybe even just the probing using the microscope because under the microscope, if you ever have experience, then the field of view, the field of view becomes very narrow. So you don't have uh, much leeway to see different uh, areas. So always start simple. So that's part of the, the, the reason that we, we use the microscope. 
Um, then do some non-surgical approaches, scaling, root planing, and uh, charting, and then gradually move on to anterior, um, anterior uh, surgeries, one, two, three teeth. We'll talk about that later. So this is, has been fun, and uh, currently we have some students already and uh, that really adapt to micro approach. And then when they go home, a lot of our students uh, coming from international, just like me when I was a student. So when they go back to their own, their home, hometown, and then they start to implement microsurgical curriculum too. So this is how we, uh, you know, spread the knowledge and the disseminate knowledge. And also in 2021, we start to uh, invite fellows to our institute. It's a PIMA and uh, and Maite mentioned to you the PIMA program, and this is a um, very formalized program, whereas we have uh, structured ways and uh, we introduce deliberate practice, deliberate practice meaning that we really need to have steps to get to uh, the excellence in practice under the micros under microscope. So this is one of the practices that we, we did there. It was to have the uh, rats and uh, the femoral arteries, which was about one millimeter diameter. And then we cut it and then we used the 10 zero sutures. So, so this is how precise we want to train our residents, train our students to be. And then put the 10 sutures on the one millimeter diameter uh, a vessel and then we, we open up and to see if there's a reperfusion. So that's an that's a interesting practice that we do and uh, also very fortunate to work with my mentor, Dr. Diego Velasquez and also Reno Buchard as well in Zurich. And then we published the book actually uh, last year as well. So that's, part, that's the, you know, the, the collection of the everything you should know about microsurgery. So this book uh, took a lot of time working with uh, Springer Publishing. So a great a book to, to begin with and we invite all the experts uh, in this field to help us writing this book. It, I mean, for me, it's very fulfilling as well so that we finally have a book that we can really um, to get to know the microsurgery from beginning to intermediate and to the advanced uh, approaches here, all right? So this is the time, I mean, this is during the COVID actually with uh, uh, Aunt Diego's, uh, Dr. Velasquez here at his, um, you know, the cottage by the lake, beautiful. And then this is a time when Reno Bucard visit Michigan. So we, we invite our residents and uh, to the, the cottage here and lake house and we had some discussions about the, the books and about the futures of a microsurgical approach. And even like after that, we still meet uh, once uh, every three months and uh, via the Zoom and discuss about the advancements and the research ideas and also clinical experiences with microsurgery. So really appreciate for you know, the mentorship. And uh, I'm really happy that I see a lot of young faces. You are the, you know, the next generation of uh, you know, our society and you have great teachers, educators here and really nurturing you. And uh, I feel really happy that we, we are in the right track here. Okay, so there's a one concept in really um, I learned a lot from using the microscope is I didn't realize, even though we, we kind of practice every day and, um, and uh, we kind of know this, however, it's not really emphasized. And I think it's really important. A lot of research lines can build around this concept so that one, say like um, tomorrow, I don't know if you practice tomorrow or Monday, then when you practice, and think about this, uh, this concept, which is, I think is really important for me, I just eye-opening. So think about this and also see how this can impact your practice and how you study and your research as well. And we know that we all have the five senses, right? So when we eat, we taste and the great uh, Chilean food. And the, here, I love uh, the white fish here a lot. Yeah, and the, 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 the pickles uh, uh, sour, 
Yeah, so that I, I had three. I have a three. Yeah, so that's that's great. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, so we taste, and also using the tongue, and also we hear too. That's how we sense the environment, right? When I was in, um, you know, Tomoko, and there's like different kinds of birds and different sounds, and you hear the water springs. The it, it's just beautiful. Enjoy the nature, and you know, you smells and the great wine here as well in the valleys. And uh, what is really related to us is really the tactile feelings, right? You, how you feel um, the, the hard tissue and the soft tissue that we care the most, right? And uh, this is something that's really how we can get information. Because nowadays it's all about the information, right? You have Instagrams, Facebook, and everything, social media, and how we get information is really from the surroundings and how we collect information in the content of um, practice is really your fingers. And when you do the exams, how you do the exams, other than just uh, we'll talk about another uh, a sense, which is the eyes, very important. How we feel, right? When we see there might be an infection, what you do, you use your fingers and to touch and to see if there's, a, you know, pus or exudate coming out, and that's the important thing. So, first thing is that your tactile feeling from your fingers when you do the sutures and how how much time you you have an idea of how much how much tension you put on your sutures. And also, when you use your tissue forceps to grasp the soft tissue for your suturing, how much time you feel like, how, how much force you put on the soft tissue. And uh, those are the important information that we tend to forget because it's become a natural process. You don't really think about it. However, these are important things because you need to get the information. And we'll talk about uh, later that a lot of our um, practices are built around the regenerative procedures, which are very important. Regeneration, regenerate soft tissue, regenerate hard tissue, so that whether you have a lot of people like placing implants or saving teeth, you place the biomaterials, what is most important thing is get primary closure, right? We all want to get a primary closure. And then how much force, how much residual tension within the flap becomes very important. So that's the part using your tactile feeling and you can potentially feel. All right. And also one thing is more important and that microsurgery can help is really to utilize the magnification so that we can really see what we see. And I know most of you probably start to use in loops now, yeah, yeah, see? So the loops, it usually goes to like a 2.5 and a 3.5 uh, magnification times, yeah. And uh, there are some more higher magnification ones, like a 6x, and you see the industry is going higher magnification. So that makes natural sense that we should, uh, you know, embrace a technology, so a microscope that can help us to augment augment our eyes so that we really can see and uh, in the very detailed. So those things are very important and how and also the, the CPUs, our brain is super important as well, right? Important. And uh, the brains can sense all the information that coming from your tactile feeling or from coming from your eyes and you start to process the information. It was uh, studies, a lot of studies showing that within like a second or two, our brains always functioning and uh, sense the information and making critical thinking process. The same for doing the surgeries as well, right? How you decide where you made the incision, how you decide if you want to do a full thickness or partial thickness flap, reflection and how much you want to reflect epically beyond the mucogingival junction and uh, what's the bone topography looks like and determine if you can graft or not and also how you suture, where you suture 
right? And also, you suture the papilla or you start with the mid facial, and uh, you want to decide if you want to draw a vertical incision and how you clean the implants. And the implantitis, we treat implantitis later. So those are the things that we really need to think about, right? And without information, the more information we get from our tactile feeling or with our eyes, the more information you can collect to make a decisions. So those are the things all integrated. And during the procedures, we probably don't think much about this, but that's how our uh, body works. That's the beauty of the, you know, the nature that's built that, that way so that we really can think through. And uh, here, I, I love uh, uh, Egypt, so I also love to, to understand the different uh, areas of the history, also read the uh, histories about Chile as well. It's Beautiful, city, beautiful history. And here, this is uh, Egyptian God's eyes, Horus, right? And if you know this. And uh, again, visual input is very important. So when we see better, then it can help us to make a better decision. So that comes to the importance of using the microscope. And the tactile sensation, I explained to you a lot already. So this is all important as well, because when we use the microscope, all of a sudden that we use the bimanual instrumentation. That means we have two, uh, our two hands, when we, especially when we make a, a ties, sutures, we're not using our fingers to make ties anymore because finger is not give you enough information. We use two tying forceps on both hands to make our ties. So all the information will come in from the interface between your fingers and the instruments and the, between the instruments to the soft tissue so that we can really get very light information, very essential information within that interfaces. So that interface can send information back to our brain. And then you know how much force you put on the uh, soft tissue and when you do the suturing. Because normally if you don't, you wanna have less than four to 10 grains of the, the forces when you suture for the primary closure. If more than that, a lot of times from the literature, Cortellini and from Dr. Bucars, from Pini Prado, from Italy, and you know that's a force that uh, you cannot have more. Once you pass that threshold, you have a higher chance for soft tissue dehiscence, opening and have infection. So this is important, the tactile sensation and the interpretation cannot explain to you more for this importance. So these are connected to the action too. And this is not only just one direction, it's bi-directional, right? So you have the information that coming from your periphery, from your eyes, especially from your fingers and sent to your brain and your brain will process the information and uh, then make a decision and uh, send the information back to tell your eyes what to look for, right? For example, if there's a very thin phenotype, what do you do? You need to be very careful, right? And then that's the information the brain will tell you. This case is a thin phenotype case, high risk, aesthetic concerns, and you need to be taking extra effort, extra careful about that. And the same for your hands as well. And you know this is a thin phenotype. When you suture, you need to be extra careful and you need to look for whether your sutures get loose or tight enough or too tight. Because when you're too tight, what will happen? Usually you see blanching, right? The tissue get whitish. Yeah, so that's why you see. And the, the microscope can really help you to see that. I'll show you some videos there as well. Okay, so this is something new that um, you know, I, I thought about the process and how, how you explain to people who are new or uh, naive about this technology, what the microscope can potentially do to help, to help us for a predictable outcome. So this is more like a team effort. We, we always like to make acronyms and the team efforts. So basically, it's to allow to delicate tissue handling. So that's the first thing that microscope can help us 
and the based on you know your how you see things and how you feel things. I explained to you. For example, small size tissue. When we deal with delicate interdental papilla, so we really need to have a good tissue handling and also very thin phenotype. So those are the things where we really need to be careful and uh, with the high magnification and also illumination, that's really the key. And also secondarily, it's important thing is to visualize etiology, right? We try to you know, cure the disease by removing the etiology factors. So this is really important. Without knowing the etiology, then it's really hard to, to get the outcome we want. A lot of the times, maybe the tooth have a micro crack, there's a vertical roof fracture, and then we don't have a way to treat. And sometimes we don't see it, and we still treat the tooth. At the end, the, to the infection won't resolve. So that's one example of how we look at the etiology. And uh, it's more important for perimpentitis as well. And um, in pentitis, when we look at the root surface, root surface not always clean, especially with calcified tissue and uh, the debridement makes very important. So with the high magnification, we can see the etiology and provide the treatment to removal. And the important concept, this is important too. Um, a lot of times we say the surgery is for access, right? For just to help you open the gum so that we can see because for treating periodontitis, we know all the literature from Dr. Stenbaugh and from Wellhawk and those are the articles that you, you read before. And uh, in terms of uh, removing calculus, when the pocketing is more than five millimeters, then, then there's less efficient to remove the calculus. We know that, we learned that. And uh, flap opening is definitely to access so that you can really can get to the calculus. However, what is important as well is to look, right? You need to know where the calculus is or what you're looking for before you can remove it. So everyone agree. We need to see. I mean, that's a very simple um, experiment, put that way. And uh, maybe Monday you go back to your private practice and you have a surgery. You open up the wound, maybe the distal of the second molar, you have calculus. And don't look yet and just use your cavitron or using your hand instrument and start to instrumentation and uh, clean. And when you feel like you're, you feel like you're exhausted, tired, or like you feel like you're good at, uh, you feel good that you, you remove most of the calculus, grab a mirror and uh, check again. You'll be surprised that a lot of calculus is not removed, even though you have access. That's because you don't see it. Everything you do becomes insufficient. In, yeah, so in that way, it's important that we really need to see before we can be very efficiently remove the etiology. So that comes to the importance of uh, using microscope. And also magnify the anatomical structures. A lot of times we are too, um, we don't get the outcome we want. Part of the reason is because we are afraid, afraid of, um, working around important anatomical structures or we, we are not able to understand anatomy. Give you the example, the stridular membrane, right? When we extract the tooth from the maxillary molars and sometimes if without any uh, high magnification, what we normally don't get is if this is aggression tissue or is this something that's uh, Schneider membrane, and uh, when you have that kind of guesswork, then it becomes hard, that becomes um, unclear. If we, our procedure is not clear, a lot of times we cannot get the outcome we want. So with a microscope, you can see the Schneider membrane very clearly, so that, or you can dis determine, differentiate, if this is a normal anatomy, whether it's a f uh, perforation already, or there is uh, still a, a fragment of soft tissue that you have to remove before you place the bone graft for your sake grafting. Another important thing is the mental nerve. 
because I scare a mental nerve to death because when we work on this, we're always afraid that patient will get numbed uh, for the rest of the life uh, when, they, when you do the guided bone regeneration or do your soft tissue, right? And uh, why we are afraid? Because we, we don't see a clear picture of the, the mental nerve. And uh, once we see it clearly, and then we have a way to deal with it. And also bone irregularity. The bone topography is really the key for us to decide if the graft will work or not. Uh, everyone agree, like the three walls, infrabony defects, we talk about that at the, you know, the period 101, like um, entry level class. When there is a one wall defect, maybe not easy to graft, unpredictable. Right? And when you have a two wall or a three walls, and then you have a higher chance to, for the grafting. And under the microscope, high magnification with the bright light, then you can have a better idea of what type of defect you deal with. And the minimally invasive approach as well is really important. We talk about minimally invasive a lot, especially in the medical field. You see the Da Vinci, the procedures all done by the robots and the very small incisions when you have a, a appendicitis and then in the past you have to open for the abdomen in order to do the debridement. Nowadays it's different. We do this minimally invasively so the healing patients healing becomes faster in the medical field. Same for the dentistry, but maybe for a little bit different reason as well. Of course, the patient's uh, center outcomes we really need to take care of. We don't want to have a patient to suffer too much. And by performing the minimally invasive approach, possibly done using the microscope, and can really reduce the patient's uh, pain medication taken, and also the patient's recovering times faster. Another important thing is for the minimally invasive is, I mean, this is my experience as well. I'm sure you have experience as well, right? When you do a single tooth, for example, uh, anterior for the guided bone regeneration, and a lot of times you see your bone get, get beautifully horizontal bone growth. And at the same time, you look at adjacent teeth, there's some papilla recession or facial recession. Those are kind of things we start to pay attention now because we not only just treat the side with uh, deficiency, we need to take care of the adjacent teeth. And a lot of times we create our own problem that we cannot come out. And when we make our incision, and especially the thin phenotype, the tissue start to recede and then patients start to point to you and they say, uh, doctor, and uh, I have a black triangle, I have a recession that the teeth looks longer. And uh, with a minimally flat reflection and the incision, and uh, this part we can potentially, not say totally reduce the problem, but we can potentially reduce the negative volumetric changes uh, due to your procedures. Okay, and uh, this is not an important concept and then I'll very quickly, I'll go to some cases to explain to you these uh, important concepts now. We, we all know that uh, wound healing comes into different phases from our, uh, you know, physiolog physiology learning or pathology or period literature. We know the first phase from acute healing because when we do the incisions, the surgeries, acute trauma, the first thing that happens is what? Hemostasis and they start have the inflammatory phase, correct? Yeah, so that takes about two to four days before that's the, our nature body defense to a trauma. You have the inflammatory phase and up and down you release cytokines. Those cytokines helped to you know, calm the body first and to remove the infectious um, you know, uh, the etiologies. And the later will come to the proliferation phase, proliferatory. You have all the new cells, granulation tissues, and um, those kind of growth factors come into place and to repair or regenerate the tissue. And the third phase becomes remodeling. 
remodeling phase that takes about months too. So those are the phases come integrated. It's not like a separate here, one, two, and three. They are all integrated. And what is important about uh, you know, the healing is really, especially for regeneration, my mentor always joke around, we do uh, resective procedures, right? We cut the gum and we cut the gum tissue and we cut the bone tissue down. And then if the patient don't die, the tissue will heal. You agree? Yes. And for regeneration, it's different. Regenerations really need to have a soft tissue coverage. And the patient will see on the x-ray or your probing, and they want to see the outcome. So that comes in importance, especially we do more of the regenerative procedures now. So the early wound stability becomes the key. And uh, all of the research point to the conclusion that if we can bypass the first phase of the inflammatory uh, phase, quickly enough so the body can jump into the proliferative phase and that's the best. That's how we can get more predictable outcome. We can do an early and accelerated healing. So this is important. And uh, how you define the early uh, wounds, the, uh, wound healing is really, first is the tissue perfusion. We'll talk about this later. And also how we stabilize the biomaterials how we stabilize our membrane. These are the very important. As soon as we can get early wound stability, and then we can get accelerated and better wound healing under the cellular level or under the tissue level, we know that. And then at the end, what we really aiming for, strive for, is a clinical outcome. We want to see there's improved clinical and patient-centered outcomes. So this is the series of the you know, events that happening that guard us of the using the technology and in the future that helpful for us to you know, get a more predictable outcome, get a more um, accelerated outcome too. So this concept is really important. If you go home and I cannot offer you more and this is something that you really need to keep in mind. And uh, this is my personal observation and uh, read a lot of literature and see comparing. You see, nowadays the literature is a lot of randomized controlled trials comparing different techniques using different materials. I mean, to be honest, those are not the really important things. What is more important is the you know, paradigm shift, how we can understand the science, the wound healing more, so that we can have a better idea of treating, treating the periodontal diseases, including treating periodontitis. And this is what I observed. How we compare the two things, like A from B, um, interventional approaches, we always look at the mean, right? We compare the mean and to see if there's a significant difference. The p-value is, uh, we often decide it's 0 0.05 or less, and that is the, you know, the significant difference. And then we can write a paper and say, oh, there's some differences between the two approaches. And if you read the articles a lot, you will see that a lot of times there's no difference, non-significant differences. There's no difference between type A from type D. For example, here in this case, microsurgery and traditional, there's some studies showing there's some advanced uh, improvements using the micro approach. And a lot of times you see there's no differences. But I think one important thing that you really need to pay attention and we have to pay attention as the next step of our education is really look at a standard deviation. So that is very important as well. And because we are not treating an average patient, every patient is different. Every patient has their different features and um, the different characteristics. And then, even though the mean will be the same, and if the micro can give you a more consistent result, meaning that standard deviation is narrow, comparing to a wide standard deviation like this approach, conventional approach, then that will be an advantage because, again, we are treating each patient differently, individually. They're not the same. So if we can get more consistent results, 
And then that's the goal. And that's what I see in my practice as well. I mean, over a period of time with some, you know, learning with the microsurgery, I feel like each patient get more consistent outcomes. So those are the things we can control. A lot of things that um, why micro is hard to you know, prove is superior to, I mean, I'm not necessarily I'm biased and I feel like micro can really do a lot of good things. However, in the literature, you don't see a lot, especially for perio. And why is that? A lot of times it's because there's some inherent case characteristics that we cannot control. For example, if patients smokes and a lot of smoking, and that definitely can change the outcome, we know that. And also patients' oral hygiene can change a lot as well. So those are things we might not be able to control, but there's a lot of things we can control with our hands so that we can get more predictable outcome, right? So those are the things it's important for you to understand. And uh, I can tell you, and in the 90s, in 2000s, there are already some uh, attempt, some, um, some push for using the microscope, especially in perio. And there's some pushback, meaning that there's some drawbacks, and that we didn't have a good success at the time. And the part of the reason is because of this, and talking to different people, experts, at that time, Dr. Tibet and uh, Diego Reynolds, and then really the differences back then and the nowadays in 2023 at this moment, and really the type of cases we treat is are different now. For example, in the past, a lot of times we, we do a four arch cases from incisors all the way to the second molars. That's the type of procedures we do for osseous procedures and try to reduce uh, probing depth, trying to, you know, stay, to save the teeth. And a lot of times at that time, there's implants not even popular yet. And the demand was different from patients too. All the demands, most of the demands only for function. Patient wanna can chew, can eat, can talk. Those are the demands. And also focusing on posterior teeth at that time. And also at that time, the microsurgery, the device is expensive. E expensive, easily like 40, 50 uh, US dollars, K US dollars. And nowadays it's a different now. And nowadays we treat teeth that with one to three uh, very localized area. I hope that's the experience we have here in Chile, Santiago as well. And uh, we more, more often focusing on one to three teeth. And in that aspect, micro can be very helpful because you only focus on one to three teeth, a narrow field of view. And then you will get um, you know, good, um, you don't need to change the direction of the microscope a lot. And it becomes the workflow, how you treat it becomes very easy. And uh, anatomy too, different now. In, in the past, you look at the teeth and you have to take care of the buccal side and take care of the palatal side, lingual side. And constantly you have to move the microscope. That's why one of the problems now we hear a lot of comments is the microscope very slow down your, your procedures. However, things has changed now since we focus only one, two, three teeth and we focus on edentulous area where you can really see from the buckle, see to the lingo and you don't really need a lot of indirect view anymore. So this really can help improve our workflow. And also the demands are different. Now we look at anterior areas, we take care of aesthetics, soft tissue, and this is the important and also can make a microsurgery uh, very efficient. And the cost already cost down a lot. A lot of competitors and coming in, the, the devices becomes relatively straightforward. And very quickly, I will talk about the history of the, as I mentioned, history is very interesting because that's how we learn and how we can improve. Um, here is in the 14th, 15th, 1500s in the Renaissance period uh, in Italy, Florence, 
like talented people already start to use the, the single lens to improve their look, to improve their vision, improve their eyes. Because when we age, what happens normally is like when you see things and you have to remove, like when you read the uh, newspapers, even like me, past like a 40 year old, <laughs> you start to have some problems with that. So these uh, intelligent guys start to develop the device that already help to look, uh, you know, have a better, clearer vision. And the 1600 to 1800 is the booming area. The technology start to come in and the put in different lanes into the, the binoculars and the here even like looking at the little details so that they can really understand the surrounding areas. And this is a time when we discover their microbiology and the learning about the bacteria, the gram positive, gram negatives, those things. And uh, then this is a revolving microscope that we learn as uh, you know when we were dental students and look at the lab. Those those are the things that start to be close to um, the micro. And here in the medical field, that's interestingly, it's not until like uh, 1922 you start to have the ENT doctors start to pick up the information and start to using the microscope to embrace the technology and using the microscope to look at the different structures and start to treat uh, ENT problems here. And the 46, the eye doctors start to use in the 10 zero suture. You see these are the uh, fine, very fine sutures and used to treat our you know, eye diseases. And the surprisingly is not until like 1940s and uh, our plastic surgeons started to use the fine needles and the sutures start to, in, uh, to just connecting the, the vessels together. And this is basically the um, history of um, microsurgery using in dental back in the early 1900s already using the microscope. And however, at that time, the micro was not uh, popular because the technology was not there yet. And really, one of the, you know, the technicians started using the microscope to check the, the margins and the fit if there's um, you know, a crack on the uh, PFM crowns or those kind of things, restoration. And this is the really the beautiful story coming from the endo. I don't know if we have endodontists here sitting uh, in, the, in the audience. And this is the, how the, the, the first um, specialty, dental specialty that embrace this technology is our amazing endodontist who use the microscope to looking for small calcified canals and orifices and so that we can improve the endodontic treatment outcome. So since then, I mean, at least in the U.S., all the endodontic programs and uh, mandate to use uh, to be trained uh, students have been trained using the microscope. So that's the vision uh, of the PIMA as well. Eventually, what we are trying to really do is really to have our students to learn the microscope. It's not we start with the optional uh, program and later all our students need to use the technology here all right and also the OMS oral surgeons is very close to the medical and use that as well in terms of a perio it's really the channel like I mentioned to you and Dr. Tibet's and uh, in the 90s start to use the microscope for treating the periodontal therapy and the renal book heart and the uh, Hussler and they start to using the microscope for performing very sensitive plastic surgeries here. And uh, Cortellini Donetti, who was trained uh, under Dr. Shanelik and they start to using the microscope for doing very delicate guided tissue regeneration procedures. In the implant therapy and in Michigan, we use the micro and publish a paper about using a microscope for treating a, a sinus augmentation. We'll talk about this later. Okay, so I mentioned the team approach and this is a very interesting part. And you can see this is after the socket extraction. And then <clears throat> with the high magnification and with the lights, and you really can see this is uh, you know, the alveolar bone and the, between the alveolus and also the sinus. And you see this is the nutritional canals into the sinus. 
So all of a sudden, you have a tool that can help you to understand the anatomy I mentioned, the team effort, team approach. You can play around, play again, and I can see around. You see here, even very thin bone, and underneath, behind that, is uh, the Schneider membrane. It's like the Andes Mountains, right, from Chile, and the other side is uh, Argentina already. So here, this is very important thing that we can capture. On the other hand, so that was the intact breath in the, in the sulcus. And you see the membrane already perfed. You see here, there's a perforation, and there's no bone there. And if you are not able to see this, sometimes if you thought that it's aggression tissue, and you start to clean, and then you make the perforation bigger, and what will happen, the patient have a communication or enteral communication, and then the patient start to build some infection, and that can be a, a nightmare to you, to us too, not only for you, for everyone. Yeah, so this is the something that I just give you a really simple example of what we can really see under the microscope. Yeah, so this is for me, it's eye-opening. I see this and uh, yeah, I, it makes sense that we should have a higher magnification. And not only that, it's just uh, uh, illumination. The light is important as well. This is like a root canal. Like we, we don't have the good light, and for example, the loops, right? Are the loops coming from different angle. It's an external light source. And so you always have a blind spot, and then you cannot get the light where you want. Comparing to the micro, microscope, then you can really see where your know, light where you see, so that you can really see it. <clears throat> okay, so then we'll talk about a little bit sh shift uh, you know, the gears, and then we'll talk about um, how the imaging help us understand uh, the, the wound healing here. And we all born with the x-ray. X-ray is great. We have a patient come and we take x-rays, we look at available bone level, we look at the jaw bone thickness, for example, the combing CT, and uh, radiograph is great, looking at the heart tissue. However, we don't have a technology at this moment yet routinely that look at the soft tissue. Oh, agree, right? So there's no good way we look at the soft tissue, which is more important now uh, in our society, in our, <clears throat> in our field. For example, the tissue phenotype, how often we look at that? We just get the probe in and we see if the, the probe show through uh, soft tissue and determine if this is a thick or thin phenotype. Um, that, that is okay. However, we want to quantify the tissue, especially for research. We want to know in millimeters and what happened. So the soft tissue phenotype, something that we really want to know because we know the different phenotypes and they react differently. And that comes to the flat design we'll talk about very importantly. We learn a lot from the imaging. How we design the flat so that the coronal advanced can you know, be more efficient so that we can enhance our soft tissue and hard tissue augmentation. And lastly, wound healing. How we evaluate the wound healing currently. We don't have much clue. And currently, we bring the patient back at two weeks. We remove the sutures. And uh, then we just pray and hope the you know, gum tissue or the bone tissue will heal up after four months. And a lot of times, guess what? It happened to me as well. We open up the, the gingiva and about to place the implant. I don't even see where I place the bone graft. The bone graft has never happened before. And uh, it's an unpredictable outcome. So the wound healing becomes very important. And from the research, we know that early wound healing is important. Then we can even predict uh, what will happen in five, four months uh, at the 10 day follow up using the ultrasound imaging. So this is the, you know, the team that we have here at Mandy Rodriguez, and now is in uh, Chicago now, you know, doing the residency originally from uh, Venezuela. And uh, this is uh, Ankita and uh, Samo now is a first year residence as well and in Iowa. <clears throat> and uh, they're fantastic colleagues and working with us in the 
ultrasound uh, research for two years. This is my research partner, Dr. Oliver Krifgens, and uh, he's the medical physicist uh, and uh, specialized in uh, dental uh, uh, medical ultrasound. And uh, with uh, his help, that we developed a device that we're able to, to use in the dental field. And uh, in terms of the ultrasonography, and why we use ultrasonography is, I did some extensive studies back in the 2010 to 2015, that period of time, and we published a lot of combing CT studies, and I realized there are some limitations with the combing CT. And that's the time I started to approach Dr. Oliver Krivgens and start to find ways to, to use the technology to help us to understand the wound healing. At, at that time, there's some limitations. We know the ultrasound is not different from what you use to look at the babies and uh, look at the different parts of the body. However, differences are first, the resolution is not high enough. When we have a baby, we're excited and look at the babies, try to look at the face, that's, that's good enough. However, in the delicate tissue, periodontal tissue, it's really hard because we want to have a high resolution, like a 50 micron to 100 micron resolution. So that's, that's something that's the missing, at least back in the 2015, when we first approached Oliver. And things have changed, which is good. And uh, then the second thing is the probe. When we use, look at the baby, the probe is like a huge, humongous, it's just too big and then gigantic, grande. So what happened is we really need to miniaturize the probe so the probe can stick into the mouth and look at the periodontal structure there. And uh, the good thing is about uh, ultrasound is really there's no radiation, ionizing radiation. On the x-rays, we cannot keep shooting patients with combing CT every three months. Everyone agree, right? Because it's not ethical and uh, that's a recommendation we don't do every day. Not ionizing is very helpful. You can just grab the ultrasound and do the scan the way you want, and then there's no harm to it, and it's non-invasive. Explained to you, and other than you know, when you look at the soft tissue, currently how you study the tissue phenotype. If you really want to measure the soft tissue thickness, you grab an endophile and you numb the patient, and you poke the patient, and you try to see the the measurements, the calibrate. Yeah, I'm not sure if you want to do that. And it's the real time too. It's very helpful, real time. You get the image on the monitor that attached to the, the machine so that you really can see it. And the chair size, so that's the real time. This is me, this is Alejandro from Mexico. Mexico, and uh, cost effective. The cost is much less than the Comin CT. And I don't want to bore, bore you with, uh, with uh, some mechanisms, however, Bear with me about 10 minutes or go to the clinical aspects now. And here is the probe or the transducer that send the sound out to the structure you want to look at. Here, the periodontium, for example. And uh, how the sound work is when the sound hit the interface. For example, it's air with the soft tissue or soft tissue, hard tissue interface or the crown to the, uh, the air. And the sound will bounce back. When the sound's back, and the same transducer will receive the information. And based on the speed of sound, we will calculate, we're able to calculate how far the structure is, like a sonar, right? In the, in the underwaters, in the sea, and you send out a signal, and the signal comes back, comes back, and you can see you know, how far the object is. Same, similar concept. Okay, so this is another book we published uh, with Oliver. And this is the prototype that we developed uh, uh, back in 2015, working with the company. And you can see this is a caliper. And the unique part of this uh, probe is, first, it's a high resolution. It's uh, 20 to 30 uh, megahertz. That's translate to about 64 micron. So that's the resolution that you're able to see. Comparing to currently the Combin CT, 200, 300 microns, maybe, so it's high resolution. And second part is small. It's very small, and you see this a caliper. And this distance is about six millimeters, the housing. And the lens is 16 millimeters. 
and it's very suitable for intraoral indication and very helpful. You can move the probe all the way to the posterior area without any problem. Yeah, so this is very helpful. And the third one is if you ever uh, look at uh, uh, ultrasound, and we oftentimes use this called hockey stick ultrasound uh, probe. However, this one designs a little different. So the probe, the, the core or the cable comes out of the oral cavity and it's in a 90 degree direction. So that's really helpful for the oral indication. So that's the, the design that we work with the company Mindre at, at, at California, Mountain View. And um, really the important things that I really want to convey with you is you not expect you to understand a lot of the ultrasound imaging. But what is really important is how we use the information from the research to apply to the clinical outcome and to the patient care. And based on that, we have the evaluation, which is very important too, because without evaluation, we don't know what's going on. With the evaluation, we can modify our approach, then that's how we keep improving. And this is all the, the team members with the supports and, uh, and uh, the grant support as well. Like Maite mentioned that the NIH funding, we recently received like 2.5 million US dollars to study the ultrasound, to study the wound healing, and there's a pending studies and other non-foundational uh, uh, research grants coming in to really support our research. Okay, so very simple here I want to show you, and hopefully this will you know, get you to understand the micro uh, ultrasound. Here this is the histology. I mean, this is not human, so <laughs> yeah, this is a, a peak uh, study that we did. So we want to compare, <laughs> compare the differences between the ultrasound and the histology, which is the gold standard, and also the uh, combing CT. And uh, because this is decalcified, the enamel just gone, but I just outlined it for you to mirror it. So this is one to one ratio. And we make a knots, notches on the surface as well. So each time we know where we scan on the teeth. And this is, uh, again, this is the ultrasound image. And looks like, uh, looks uh, foreign to you for sure. But I wanna explain to you ultrasound, look at the interface and look at the soft tissue, very great for soft tissue uh, imaging. And this is the, we put a probe cover, it's like exam gloves, we put on the cover so that it will show, it's for infection control, the same. And what you see here, this is the surface of the enamel, okay, relate to this. And this is the soft tissue surface relate to here. And this is the bone surface. Got you? Bone surface relate to here. All right, and this is all soft tissue. <coughs> and as I explained to you, the ultrasound once they hit the interface, the sound will bounce back, especially the hard tissue. When you hit the, you know, the bone, and the sound will bounce back. What you see behind is just an uh, artifact. You don't see anything anymore beyond the hard tissue. However, you know, for the soft tissue, it's great. You see here, for the combing CT, you don't see much of the soft tissue. And uh, however, for the soft tissue on the ultrasound, you can see this is the, the muscles, and you see these different structures that you see, and they are very important. <clears throat> okay, and you see here, this is the soft tissue. I want to highlight to you, correlate to this direction, this location. All right, so everyone get a sense of how to read ultrasound already? Yeah, very good. Okay, and all of a sudden we can do different types of measurements now and in terms of tissue phenotype. We can measure the soft tissue height, which is very important for us to determine if the, the crown lengthening procedure is predictable or how much recession we might happen and uh, how much of the soft tissue you can have to hide your implant crowns here, the soft tissue height. And uh, you can measure the soft tissue thickness as well and at a different level, and this is probably, this is the caliper, I give you a reference 
here, one millimeter or longer than that, you can measure from one millimeter from the uh, soft tissue margin or two or three millimeters down. So it's not only just the one time measurements, it gives you the image so that you can really, this is a cross-sectional image, so you can measure it. And also you can measure the crystal bone thickness at about one millimeters down, even though you don't have, you don't see the root behind the bone, however you can trace at least where the, the root would be so that you can know the crystal bone thickness would be. All of a sudden we have the tool to look at cross-sectional view, look at the facial tissue that we don't see from the 2D x-ray. So this is very helpful for, for example, the orthodontic treatments. Nowadays we see a lot of recessions. We'll show you later the cases. The recessions and then if we can have a way for the screening phase, the patient one of before put in the braces and then they put there and we can look at the not the adhesions because when there's a recession it's always there's a bone loss bone loss to begin with so if we can see there's already a bone loss soft hard tissue adhesions and then we might have a way to predict to prevent recession so these are important things and uh, those are the data that's from the, the research that is really good alignment. You don't need to read uh, all the details, the fine prints here. But we're comparing the soft tissue high measurements between the histology, which is the gold standard, to the ultrasound, and it is very good alignment uh, between the two. And also we look at soft tissue thickness. And again, this is a good uh, agreement. Usually agreements uh, is between zero and the one. We've done research and you know it's a correlation. Ideally, the correlation will be one or a negative one if you have a negative uh, correlation. And uh, between one to 0.5 is a fair correlation. Between 0.5 to 0.75 is a good correlation. Beyond that will be an excellent uh, good alignment. So here's a look at the uh, bone thickness as well. And overall, it's a good alignment. And the here important thing is a lot of times we look at the Combin CT if you have an experience. If the bone is very thin, from that Aquarian study, when the bone is thin, less than one millimeter, normally the Combin CT won't see it. However, the ultrasound can tell you a lot. For example, here, in the cases that we did, about 80 cases we had the pigs slides. And then about 10% of the time when the bone is thinner than one millimeter, Combing CT didn't see it. So that's why there is a poor agreement here between the histo histology and the combing CT, whereas there is an excellent agreement between the ultrasound and the histology. So that's the key finding we had, and it's very important, and it gives you a clinical perspective as well. This is a really a patient that we saw, and this is a fistula, and with the internal root resorption, the root canal done, uh, this tooth is determined hopeless. And then once we determine the tooth is hopeless and there's different options, right? We have maybe have implant option or we have the partial denture and the fix bridge options. And we want to do the implant and even we have a decide if this is immediate implant case or it's delay case or early case, right? What is important uh, for you to determine the timing of implant placement? currently is soft tissue features, the phenotype, and also hard tissue features as well, right? I mean, all the literature tell us if there's no hard tissue, there's no wall. This is probably the type three from the Tarnos uh, classification. This is a type three socket defect, according to the Combin CT, everyone agree. And then if that's the case, you might not be able to do immediate implant placement because it's too unpredictable to place the implant immediately here on top that you don't have much bone to support it. However, under the ultrasound, you see there's a very thin layer of bone here. And again, just to orient you, this is the, uh, the crown surface here and corresponding to here. And this is your root correspond to here. And you see there's a step and coming out, this is the bone, and this is the soft tissue. So you can tell that ultrasound can really give you an idea there is a presence of the buccal plate. 
and all of a sudden your decision might change. Maybe it's possible that you can perform the immediate implant placement even though you know, if you can decide not you do it or not, but at least there's the information that you can get. And I mentioned uh, the team approach as well. And just uh, assuming this is your patient and uh, you will perform the implant placement in this case. And the adjacent tooth, you look at evaluate adjacent tooth, relatively thin tissue phenotype, and this is the papil uh, the frenum. Um, this is the soft tissue, and uh, there's some recession already happening. And then you, you need to decide how you can access to bone and place the implant now. All right, so this is the task given to you. How would you design your flap? And uh, so that you can first access, and secondarily, you don't want to traumatize adjacent tissue. So that's hard, huh? Yeah. So normally in the school, I mean, at least that's how I was trained by my, by my instructors. Usually you're doing the intracellular, not usually, or most of the time, intracellular incision and uh, mid-crestal or even palatal approach in order to preserve the you know, keratinized tissue and uh, advance here. And maybe you preserve the papilla or you include papilla in your flap, right? So that's probably what we're thinking about. But what are the downside of doing this type of approach? Think about that. Yes, it's possible you will lose the papilla here and you lose the, the facial tissue and you have recession. For some cases where there's a low aesthetic uh, concern or it's low smile line, you probably don't even care. And uh, however, we do care. We care about tissue. We don't want to traumatize tissue. So this comes to the under, fully understanding of the, you know, the imaging and uh, microsurgery. So that this is what I did actually. All right. So this is more like a, a vista kind of approach. I, I will show you what I did here. But after I placed the implant, and a lot of times you have the facial bone dehesis. There's a concavity. 20% of the time you have that from our early studies, from cadaver studies. Right. So under the microscope, you can see the perforation there. So that's the amount of perforation you see. And then you can graft from more the apical side because here is relatively straightforward. You have enough bone. And uh, then how I did was really a reversed horseshoe incision to preserve the papilla. It's kind of papilla preservation technique. And uh, I did a you know, reversed incision and uh, why I did this is because once I reflect the flap, I can see the, where the palatal bone uh, begins so that I can really make sure that my implant is in the bone. And here is where the final, final crown will, the transition line, transition zone will come out. So I make an incision and those sutures are A0 sutures nowadays I use. So it's really fully utilize the medication and the illumination so that I can place implant in this location without traumatize adjacent tissue and at the same time achieve what I want to achieve. Right? And the next phase that we are really doing is not only looking at uh, macro structures on the uh, ultrasound. What we were really looking at is to characterize different structures. As you can see, easily there are at least like eight structures that we see under the, the ultrasound. You see there's a supracrestal structure, periosteal structure, you have muscle layer, and you have spine vessels that you see on the ultrasound. And you see the, the, uh, the epithelium and the subepithelial layers, which is more of the shadow, um, very grayscale kind of and uh, those are structures that now we are correlate with uh, a micro uh, histology. And so that when there is some changes, for example, when there is an inflammatory response, and then those the 
gray scales, it's just like an x-ray. It gives us information. It's not like a random color. Here is more whitish. Here is more of the grayish. It's not random. It gives us some meaning. And when there is uh, tissue changes, for example, there's more fluid or there is a loss of the tissue content, collagen, and the ultrasound, as I mentioned, the 64 microns, can have a way to have enough sensitivity to tell us the tissue is suffocating or have some problems so that we can potentially make diagnosis out of it. So this is the beauty. The first step is to look at the histology. All right. And uh, the second part, importantly, is the tissue reflection. As I mentioned, current events, the flap, how often we do the current events flap? A lot, right? When we do the regeneration approaches, we really need to focus on how we do the scoring, periosteo, releasing, so the flap can move coronally. Everyone agree? And uh, this is important. The first time that we can look at the cross-sectional imaging, and we can understand where you do your incisions under the flap to cut the periosteum and how deep you go into the periosteum. It's all visualized here. And the common procedure we do is we raise the full thickness flap, incision and reflect past mucogenival junction all the way down, and you do your periosteal releasing so that you can start to use your uh, scissors or anything that's to separate the periosteum so that the tissue can separate. Yeah, most of the time we do that. However, currently what we're doing is more minimally invasive way, it's more innovative way to release the flap and with the understanding of this. I'll show you some cases and everyone can get a sense of the ultrasound already, correct? Yes? Yeah, so again, this is the bone. Because there's no tooth here, and uh, you don't see the, the tooth, the structure is basically the crestal part of your soft tissue. And coming here, and uh, there are different zones now that you can tell. And this is the keratinized tissue area. It's important, and tissue usually is thinner at this point. And beyond that, you have the, you know, the muscle layer that come into the mucosa, so that's thicker. And this is the mucosa layer. And all of a sudden, you can decide where you do your incision design and where you do your releasing, at what depth. For example, we always have like a deep separation. For example, we make our incision here, doing the partial thickness at the periosteal release. Or we do a shallow, shallow periosteal release. It's go more superficial so that your flap can be separate, potentially separate from the muscle pool. Or you go in between. You go in the middle, like here. And these are important, have a different meanings now. We have options and uh, then we can decide at what indication we do what approach. And this is important. Also, the blood flow can tell us a lot as well. And uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the ultrasound, ultrasound not only gives you the anatomy, but also a functional analysis as well, giving you the blood flow at least. So the colors, the different colors, the blue color and the red colors, all mean blood. So we can quantify the blood flow, we can select the region of interest, and then these are the superperiosteal plexus. And you can quantify it, and every individual have a different kinds of blood flow, and then we can tailor to it so that we can customize our incision design. And again, there are three different zones that we deal with when we perform the periosteal releasing or coronal the vents, the flap. First is the attached mucosa area. And the secondary is the mucosa area above the muscle. And third part is the mucosa layer, including muscle layer. So basically you have uh, three zones. And this is important that determine how we release the flap. And each zone have a different uh, implication, different 
um, different ways to release. Right. So basically what we do this point is we do the intracellular incision as usual and to the full thickness to bone and to the periosteum and the release all the way to beyond the mucogingival junction. Why? Because we want to keep the thickness of the tissue. So when we do this partial thickness, it's really hard because gingiva is usually about one millimeter thickness. There's very the, the gingiva at this level, attached mucosa. And only when beyond the mucogingival junction, about a couple millimeters, when the tissue start to become thicker and then you start to release, at this point, we not fully release. Once we pass this, we already start to do partial thickness, split dissection for a couple millimeters down so that we start to feel that we are approaching the muscle layers at the zone two. So this is where the zone two is, mucosa, coronal to the muscle. At, at the zone three, instead of a continue to do a deep dissection, because we want to avoid the muscle pull, which will potentially affect our wound stability, we start to do a superficial dissection. And this point, we do um, um, dissection here without any sharp instruments. We just use the tunneling knife to gently separate the mucosal layer from the underlying muscles. In that way, the tissue can be very flexible. So that's the currently how we did uh, soft tissue releasing for your soft tissue coverage or for your hard tissue regeneration. So this is the way I do now. And here just an uh, uh, illustration for you to help you understand. First, using the blade of your, your choice, 15C, or using uh, uh, any, any kinds of blades that of your choice. And you do the intracellular incision, already. And then you reflect partially to pass the mucogingival junction. Because why? Because this is the zone one mentioned to you. This is zone one because the tissue is extremely thin. Where you had the soft tissue perforation, wound dehiscence, is mainly here, right? So at the edge. So you don't want to thin the soft tissue so that you lose the tissue content. So here you do your, your full thickness. And once you beyond the mucogingival junction, the tissue start to get thicker. And you use a sharp dissection. And here, the main, main issue is, the main key point you want to achieve is really to separate your flap from the periosteum. Because periosteum is a structure is not stretchable. You cannot stretch periosteum. It's a fibrous tissue. So using the sharp dissection, very thin tissue left on the bone side so that you can separate the periosteum from the flap so that you can get initial flap releasing, which is really important. All right? So this is initial flap releasing since this tissue is detached from periosteum already. <clears throat> and the third part, now you do a reflection so you can gently separate using a tunneling knife. That's the favorite instrument that I use to separate the soft tissue, the mucosa at the zone three. Now we're at the zone three. To separate the soft tissue, mucosa, from the underlying uh, muscle. And uh, that's the way you see this is an uh, image. Zone three. So you will see that there's a very thin layer of the <clears throat> periosteum left on the bone so that this tissue can be very free. Right. So I don't want to bore with you this and uh, this is just a summary of the steps of the procedures that we perform when we handle the first the zone one where there is the edential side, there is a mucosa, zone one, keratinized mucosa, full thickness. Once you're beyond the mucogingival junction and you do a sharp dissection, you start to separate the flap from, from the periosteum. And after you, went, you go through a few millimeters, you start to do the tunneling knife and to separate at the zone three 
to separate your mucosa from the underlying muscle fibers. And there are some more details we'll talk about during the procedure. Okay. Um, what time is it now? Is it 32? And I have a case now, and uh, if you want to go through the case, so that you can fully understand what I'm talking about. All right, so this is the anterior area. We know that the soft tissue looks pretty, you know, receded, and there's not much we can do, and uh, there's some like extraction defect. This patient was referred to me because the, the, uh, the, the oral surgeon did a couple times of augmentation procedures. You will see um, the coming CT. And the goal is to place the implant. The patient still want to have an implant because it's adjacent the teeth here and not really interested in replacing those uh, uh, crowns bridges with a new bridge, All right? And then when you look at the combing CT, again, the technology is really helpful for us to look at uh, uh, cross-sectional views. At the different cross-sectional views, you can see across the board around the uh, incisor area, there's more, a little bit more bone, it's about three, four millimeters. However, in the, um, the canine area, it's really thin, as you can tell. It's not much you can place the implant. You may be able to do a split approach, you do a guided bone regeneration. You can do a block graft as well. I mean, te <coughs> technique is not as important. Which is important is the diagnosis. In this case, I chose uh, guided bone regeneration. And uh, regardless what type of technique you use, the most important thing is soft tissue release. Only have the good soft tissue release and the primary closure, then your bone underneath your flap can grow. And uh, this case, you see this is the edentulous area with a big concavity, which might be good for regeneration because you have a uh, it's like a volcano here, like uh, the, the tip of a volcano. And the palatal side, you lose some bone as well, reflection. And here shows the importance of using a, a microscope. This is at the zone two already. You can see I start to do some sharp dissection and uh, to separate the, the mucosa at the zone two from the underlying periosteum. Here is important because here is very thin. Uh, at the two side. And now I am in the zone three. This is zone three. Now I use my tunneling knife or when there's a lot of uh, scar tissue, you use the Orban's knife uh, to, you know, to navigate through the scar tissues. So this is zone three now. And uh, now you're almost going to the, the lip area. You can see this, the length is about 10 millimeters. So you go all the way and then you have some release at this point. Right? And you can still see here is not as released as the canine side. So did a little bit more using the, the more sharp instruments. So that sharp instruments, again, I wanna show you this is the important, this is just the repeat, okay? So this is the zone two. Once you pass the mucogingival junction, a couple millimeters, and you start to separate the periosteum from the flap. So in that way, there's initial separation between the periosteum and uh, the flap, and now this is at the zone three. And this is very minimally invasive. You are not in size or a blind incision. You really see visually where you do your uh, your procedure, and this is just the separation. Separation the mucosa from the muscle fibers using the very fine instruments here so that you're not massively disrupt the microcirculation. That's important for a healing. Maybe. Good. All right. And the incision, again, is important. Now, these are the seven zero sutures that we use under the microscope. These are kind of important. You place the sutures where you really need uh, primary stability, have the wound stability, rather than using the four zero sutures. So these are the very fine sutures that performed under the microscope. So these are the, uh, the after five months, six months, and you see there's a significant amount of bone gain that you can really can 
place the implant comfortably. Part of the reason that you can get more predictable outcome and to prevent perimplantitis is really gain the volume of the soft tissue in the hard tissue. In this case, I use the a PTFE um, membrane too. All right, so this is the bone that we get and also from the facial side as well. Under the, the microscope, you see this bone particulates surrounded by new bone. So that is, is one piece. And also you can also see there's some uh, fibrous tissue covering um, the, the bone particles. So you, under the microscope, you can fully evaluate the maturity of the bone so that you can kind of sure that you place the implant in a nice bone. And different kinds of guide designs you can have. This is not um, super important. And uh, you can you know, place the implant the way you want. The key is you have the reference, have the guide, and the place implant. Another beauty of using a uh, microscope for placing the implant is to really level your platform with the bone very well under high magnification. So now you know where you should place your implant at what level so that you not potentially place implant too coronally and at the end have a perimplantitis that way. And uh, this is another <coughs> implant placement here. And with the hand placement. Okay. And as I mentioned, one of the reasons we can prevent perimplantitis is to really level your platform with the bone under high magnification, whether you would do ecrocrestal, subcrestal, and uh, normally you don't do supracrestal placement. So that's the way we can place the implant in a nice position. Okay, so I will pause here and the next session we'll talk about soft tissue and uh, we'll talk about treatment of implantitis. Gracias and uh, see you later. Muchas gracias a nuestro sponsor Oral B. Y ahora sí podemos continuar con la charla de Dr. Chang. Yes, thank you. Hey, thank you. So someone got a prize here. Nice. Very good. Very good. Alrighty. So let's uh, get a regroup again and uh, look at uh, some cases. And um, I mean, as I mentioned to you, uh, really important thing is first, uh, technology is only as good as how we use it. And uh, we need to understand it's not necessary we have a technology and uh, we immediately become a better provider or surgeon. This is something that is important. However, only by deep understanding of biology, biomechanics, and the sciences, then when you use the technology fully advantage, take advantage of the technology, then we have a, a better way to improve ourselves. And it's not only, not, not to compare with others. Also, I need to understand that not necessarily using the scope will make you uh, different, superior to others. I'm not saying, uh, not necessarily mean that. So what is important is we compare to ourselves. So only by you know, improving every day, we call that this the imp incremental improvement. So that's important. Every day, if every day we are better than yesterday, and then over time, we can be a better uh, uh, profession here. And uh, I want to um, talk about soft tissue now. And then later, we'll talk about guided tissue regeneration. Hopefully, that can give you a good sense of how to apply uh, microsurgery and how to apply the knowledge that we gained from ultrasound. I want to talk about soft tissue now. And uh, a lot of times, you look at um, Instagrams or Facebooks or on the papers, 
most of the cases focusing on the upper interior, maxillary interior area, which makes sense because that's a static area, right? Um, however, what is more challenging actually is the mandibular interior area where you have very thin phenotype and the tooth position is not the best. Um, and also you have the muscle pulls here all the time from the mentalis muscles. Those are the areas really challenging and uh, I like to explore more around this area. And uh, I want to show you a few cases of a lower anterior regions. And then when we look at the case, again, we, at least we have 10 things that we have to take care of when we evaluate this area. And uh, also in order to choose the proper technique that we want to use. And uh, commonly we use the major categories of the techniques that we can apply in this lower anterior area is probably free gingival graft and the lateral sliding flap from the side and there's a current advanced flap from Epico and the tunneling as well as part of the current advanced flap without the incisions, without vertical incisions. So those are the four primary categories, uh, surgical uh, options we have in this area. And uh, once we look at the 10, at least 10 factors, and then we can decide which type of procedure give you a more predictable outcome. Yeah. And sometimes it's possible that more than one surgical techniques may work for a certain case. It's possible too and you have to decide which one work best for in your hands. Yeah, so these are my thought process. In this case, we, we go through the cases here, and the differences between um, a free gingival graft and uh, the other ones, a pedicle, we call the pedicle flaps, including lateral sliding, core events, and tunneling, the major differences, as you can tell, Free gingival grafts does not come with the blood flow, the perfusion, there's no blood flow coming. It's first a few days from the circulation, plasmic circulation from adjacent area. So in that sense, the vascular area becomes very important. Yeah. And if you, the wider the vascular area, meaning that on the root surface, the wider it is, the less predictable your soft, your free gingival graft will survive. So that comes important distinction between free gingival graft on one side and the other side is the pedicle flaps. So one with, uh, one with, uh, with the blood supply coming with the flap, the other one is a free graft where you don't come with the blood supply. And this one then, the, the size of the defect where you don't have blood supply becomes important. And also the adjacent area where you might get blood supply to support the free graft becomes important. Okay. And um, also there's another thing is you need to look at the adjacent areas in order to decide where you can borrow the tissue from. And you, you for example, so lateral sliding, we always look at adjacent side to see if there's a good tissue there. And the epical, when you do the current advanced or the tunneling approach, most likely your soft tissue is coming from epical. So in that sense, the quality and the quantity of your epical tissues or the lateral tissues becomes important for you to decide which way you want to go. Make a lot of sense. Right, so first thing first, you need to look at aesthetics. We all know that free gene graphs is like a patch work. It becomes you know, whitish and over time it's become more obvious. So of course, if there's aesthetic outcome and the free gene graph might not be your best option. And uh, sometimes you don't have options. For example, this case you see here, right? Free gene graph is really good for gaining keratinized tissue from the literature. We know that, meaning that everything epical for your recession, epical to it, epical to the mucogingival junction, and then because you place the graft at the more of the vasculized area where you have the periosteum to have the enough blood supply as long as your suturing is enough so it's not mobile, 
and then you can get the good tissue. However, you might not get the amount of soft tissue coverage on the root that you want to get. So the free gingival graft is really good for getting keratinized tissue. However, it's not enough inferior to other pedicle uh, flaps for root coverage. So that's the first thing that everyone needs to understand. And the secondary, as you can tell, in the lower anterior area, maybe back in the 70s, 80s, maybe this is not as the biggest concern because uh, lower lip is covered the area. However, more and more uh, advancement in the aesthetic concerns, uh, how many of you can kind of accept this kind of approach? From not much anymore. So we really need to think about a better way. So that, in that sense, free gingival graft might not be the best for the aesthetic outcome. And secondly, you look at the recession, the, the numbers of the recessions. For example, it's a uno or dos or tres. Yeah, so this one is a uno, right? It's one single recession here. And then later slide in my work. However, the later sliding might not work very well with multiple recessions, lower anterior, and because you don't have enough uh, tissue to cover multiple recession. So that's another second factor you need to look at. If there's a single recession, and all of the procedures might apply. However, if it's multiple recession and later sliding, not be able to do it. So for example, this is the one recession. These are the multiple adjacent recessions. So that's the second thing you look at. And the three and the four look at the size of the defect, as I mentioned, because that's a vascular area where you don't get the blood supply. So that's the width and the depth. And it really depends. If you want to consider the lateral sliding and you care more about uh, the width, because that's the amount of advancement you need to get to from either side, maybe from the left side or from the right side, because you're doing lateral movement, right? So the width becomes important, much less of the, the depth. However, if you're considered the corn advanced flap or the tunneling flap, and then the depth, this becomes important dimension because you need to move the tissue coronally. Yeah, so in that sense, the three millimeter usually is a rule. Three millimeters, the advancement. More than three millimeters usually means more difficult cases. More difficult cases. When there is a less narrower cases or a shallow cases, that's why when there's a shallow or narrow cases, usually you get better outcome. Why? Because you don't need to advance the flap that much. The soft tissue want to go back to its original place. I always joke around, uh, you know, my teenager uh, daughter, when you ask her to do something, they always don't want to do it. Yeah, that's how the rebellion it is. And uh, the same for the soft tissue as well. And soft tissue have a tendency to go back to its original location. So that's why it's important for the you know, coronary events or any tissue uh, reposition is important to release all the possible etiology factors so that tissue can potentially stay uh, at the new position. All right. So in this case, for the lateral position, again, important thing is the width, the width of the defect. More than three millimeters lateral sliding is at a higher risk. So then you might consider other approaches. And the depth that's why the lateral sliding is very good for a narrow and a deep defect because you only need to move laterally and the soft tissue, this part, this dimension does not matter much for lateral. Whereas this dimension is more important when you move the tissue up from the coronal vents or tunneling. Right. And uh, the next one is important. This uh, come together. The keratinized tissue is important as well because there are fundamental differences from the physiological point of view, anatomical point of view, the differences between attached gingiva and the mucosa. And also the vestibule is correlated with the KT. Normally when you lose the KT, you, you become the shallow vestibule. So what's the problem with the shallow vestibule is more important 
for uh, current events flap and tunneling, and less for the lateral sliding. Yeah, why? Because the current events and tunneling all care about the apical part of the tissue. When the defect is closer to the vestibule, meaning the vestibule become shallower, that means your defect is closer to the mentalis muscles. Those muscles are quite strong if you ever deal with the mentalis muscles. And those muscles will pull your tissue back to its original position, even though apparently you do a current events. So that's why the vestibule becomes important for current events flap and for tunneling. So when there's a shallow defect, it's very shallow vestibule and tunneling and the calf become a little bit issue. And the same as the KT. And uh, here's the illustration here. This is the amount of KT you really need to measure when you do your uh, approach. And these are the published in the IJPRD journal and uh, from our group. And look at the differences in the anatomical and the structure of the keratinized tissue comparing to the mucosa. And there are not only just differences between where there's a keratinized tissue on the epithelium on the, on the surface, but also the size of the epithelial cells uh, and the interdental intracellular distance is uh, totally different. And also the connect tissue structures are vast majorly different between the two types as well. Whereas you have attached gingiva, the tissue fibers usually thicker, the bundles thicker, and also is more abundant in the, you know, the collagen fibers compared to the lo loosely aligned tissues at the mucosa area. So that why, that's why we make the attached gingiva tougher uh, have a higher tensile strength um, than the mucosa. So basically the two types of tissues serve different roles in terms of uh, coronal vents flap. This one, attached gingiva, tougher, stronger. That means when you suture and there's a less chance for tearing through the keratinized tissue. So the attached gingiva or attached mucosa help us in terms of the strength at the coronal part. Whereas the mucosa is loosely arranged uh, tissues, collagens, then that's great for you release. The, the major, majority, the major part of the releasing coming from the mucosa part. Everyone agree? So the two types of a tissue serve a different functions. They are all important important day for our procedures. And uh, again, the keratinized or attached mucosa is really essential for us to prevent the tear, the soft tissue tear of the sutures. Whereas the mucosa, mobilize the mucosa, non-attached mucosa, help us to release the flap, get enough, enough release. So this is the important part of evaluating attached gingiva, the amount of attached gingiva, and the vestibule. All right, and the frenum is important too. Frenum and it's most likely on the apical side. And the frenum comes sometimes come with fibers and also even with muscles. Some studies show that the frenums come with muscles. So when the side is closer to the frenum and then apparently it's not a good for the soft tissue current advanced. And also we need to decide where the frenum is. This is important as well. Is mesial or distal to the recession as well. That is important for you to do a lateral sliding. So basically, you don't want to include a frenum into your lateral sliding flap. So that's something important. And uh, when you have an apical frenum, then of course, tunneling and the calf becomes less favorable than lateral sliding. And papilla base is important for in terms of um, you know, supporting, stabilize your flap, because that's where you put the sutures there. So whenever there is a thinner papilla, and then the base, usually use the two millimeters as a reference, you measure from here. Then any flaps that are related to uh, incisions at the papilla, for example, lateral sliding, you need to suture the papilla to adhere, for example, if you want to move this tissue 
to here, and then this papilla size becomes very important. And if you have a narrow papilla size, and the maybe the lateral sliding is not your best uh, friend. And the same for the uh, current advanced flap as well. Sometimes we do the incision line for the current advanced the flap, the, for the calf. And when you have a narrow papilla, when you do the incision and you pull the tissue up, the suture in here becomes very difficult. That's, that's something that we need to keep in mind and then maybe tunneling, if possible, would be a better option in that sense. Of course, we're not only looking at one factor, we need to look at all the factors together. And the tissue flexibility play a huge role. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way to measure tissue flexibility uh, at this point. However, a lot of times what we figure out is when there's a scar tissue, for example, there's a soft tissue placement before and the failed. Usually the tissue becomes very tough to, to release again. Why? Because all the type 3 collagen uh, fibers and type 1 is immature fibers going in a different directions. So that's why uh, the flexibility becomes the issue. Yeah, so in that sense, the important part in, in terms of flexibility is you only can tell when you enter the, the tissue, you numb the patient, you start to release. That's the point when you start to realize when there is some issue. So unless we can find some ways, for example, using the ultrasound to measure the flexibility, currently the only way you can do is when you numb the patient, you start to do your release. And the, 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 if the soft tissue just stubborn and just stop there, and even though you release and not moving up, then you know there's some flexibility issue. So, so for the tunneling, tunneling is tough because usually, especially for a very low flexibility, meaning that the flap does not move very easily, then when you do a blind release using the tunneling, that can be an issue. So when you have, um, when you realize the tissue is not moving, a lot of times that's the time for you to release the flap so that you can really see the open up so that you can see it and to release. So here I put a question mark here. When you have a flexibility issue and tunneling might not be the best option. And lastly, you look at uh, the technique sensitivity as well. Um, tunneling apparently have a higher sensitivity, meaning it takes some time to learn compared to you know, current events, the flap with the uh, incisions. So those are the uh, free graphs is relatively straightforward as long as you can harvest tissue enough thickness uh, and suturing in an additive way and it's more of the forgiving so it's not not gonna change much compared to tunneling it's really difficult and uh, the calf is moderately difficult later sliding sometimes can be difficult as well Alrighty. so here is just the summary of all the factors and uh, at least the 10 factors that um, we should look at, not only for lower anterior areas where we have, uh, we have um, you know, difficulty, but also for the maxillary incisors too. So here's just the summary. And so it's not a, uh, as easy as you know, do the procedures without thinking through. And again, a lot of things we have to process and so that we can decide you know, which uh, flap design we should go. And also, this will be uh, published uh, soon. We'll get accepted at the IJPRD, the International Journal of Periodontal and uh, Periodontal Restorative Dentistry, yeah, PRD. So yes, and uh, it's not, um, it's accepted, but not published yet. But you will see this soon. And if you need any more information, feel free to just email me so I can give you the information. There's no secret here. And um, yeah, again, the RT type from the new classification is still the key. That interproximal attachment still dictate how much we can uh, core advance, how much soft tissue we can achieve so for the root coverage. So the RT type, RT1, uh, for those who are not familiar with, is where there is uh, no attachment loss. So in those cases, normally we should get a good predictable outcome. 
The RT2, when there is interproximal bone loss or attachment soft tissue loss, but the soft tissue on the facial side is still uh, lower, this RT2, you can get some coverage. However, when your facial recession is higher, even higher than the interproximal attachment, there is no chance you can get a closure, you get a, uh, get a, get a you know, the, um, recovery. All right, and uh, again, there are four main op options for you to choose from. Free general graft. Nowadays, I do less and less free general graft, even for the lower interior. Now, if possible, I will start with um, you no know, tunneling. If the single recession very deep, where I don't have a good apical tissue quality and quantity, and lateral sliding is my to-go procedure, and I will always start with the tunneling first, if that's the option when the apical is good. Uh, apical tissue is relatively good. And then if I cannot move my tissue and I start to make my vertical incisions or uh, papilla incisions so that I can do the calf. So it's more of the gradual um, thinking. So you start with a more minimally invasive approach from the tunneling and uh, then you have troubles, you face with troubles and you start to do your incisions. So that's the way I approach now. All right. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you uh, some cases and now we start to brainstorm and the thinking about uh, the procedures that we, we will potentially you know, perform. Here, this is the lower interior incisors and uh, most of the time it's associated with uh, post-ortho uh, treatment, unfortunately. Yeah, and uh, you can look at uh, you know, the, the defect I mean, first we see this is uno or dos and the tres or, and this is the one recession, right? Single recession. And you do grab your probe and you see where you can get the tissue from. And uh, you look at the tissue defect too. You see the width, you see the height, you see there's basically not much keratinized tissue at the epical. So in that case, the, from tissue borrowing from, directly from the epical, either you're doing the calf or doing tunneling might be an issue because you simply just not having enough tissue there. And the, also the shallow vestibule, the mentalis muscles just right underneath it. And this make things very difficult. Yeah. And you look at the, the frenum here, it's here and the, not much there already. So this is a type of a, uh, a thinking process you're, you're, you're thinking now. And of course, 99% of the time, this, these are the thin phenotype, right? Lower interiors, most of the time, are thin phenotype already. So in this case, I opt to have a lateral sliding flap. I hope that you, you made the, the decision like me. And under the microscope, you can start to see the mentalis muscles here. So that's the part you really need to release well so that you can free your soft tissue. Again, the soft tissue is really stubborn. It tend to go back to its original position. So this is the mentalis muscle with a, this, I was asked about the magnification. Normally this is probably about eight, eight times or 10 times of the magnification. So you can do a little bit more of the visualized uh, flap releasing. You are not really you know, a blind technique to release your flap. And then under the scope, you can place the, you know, normally, clinically, uh, what I check is I gently place the flap back and to see if it will stay just by the fibrin. If you will have tendency to go back, that means the release is not enough. Then you have to go back and release more. All right, so this is the, you know, the closure here. And another important thing is, the vertical incision, in this case, lateral sliding is necessary, unfortunately. You need to decide, uh, again, where you move the tissue. Maybe go more detail now. And whether you borrow tissue from this side or this side. So a lot of times it's determined by your frenum. As I mentioned, you don't want to include the frenum into your flap. So in this case, you have a frenum in this case. And also you look at the tissue. Here is thicker tissue. So that's why most of the time we borrow the tissue from here and move to here in, that case, in this case. So really depending on the quality and the quantity of the tissue that you borrow from. And uh, 
basically you need to look for is here first the recession and also you look around to see where you can borrow the tissue from where it is from lateral or from apical and uh, also the vertical incision is important normally we want to ex extend about two teeth and sometimes with a canine it can be can be a problem and now you decide if you want to draw a vertical here or here right? you have two options basically or even you might be able to go go to here so the bottom line is if you want to move the tissue laterally and then if you say that you drew a vertical here then your mid facial side will become exposed because you want to borrow tissue to cover the recession side. And then once you expose here, it's a gambling. And then you might have recession on this tooth. So in that case, the incision, if you decide to do your vertical, the vertical should have been here rather than here because you want to move the tissue toward that side. So the mid facial of the canine is still covered uh, by the soft tissue. All right, so follow me, correct. Yeah, so that's the important part of thinking how much extension you want to get. All right. And the suturing too, in the past we used 5-0 suture, 4-0 suture. It's very difficult for, for the detailed tissues, for example, the papillas or here, the overlapping areas. So these are the six zeros. Now I use more of the seven or even eight zero nylon sutures or polypropylenes now. And this is uh, after like uh, two years and this all of a sudden like patient have the deeper vestibule and have a keratinized tissue and patient can clean very well and the tissue becomes a little bit thicker and it looks healthy. So that's what we aim for even though there's a slight recession but that's better than what was before. Yeah. And uh, now we move on to case two. We look at this case and uh, we pause here for a few seconds. Now we think about uh, what options you might choose. Yeah, those teeth usually come with uh, post-ortho, ortho when the teeth are moved buccally, lose the buccal plate, and over time when the patient brush too hard, or it's just some trauma, and then the, tooth, the tissue start to lose, lose the ground. Yeah. Okay. So we look at the tissue, look at the case together, and a lot of you know, a lot of rec recession sides contain adjacent recession. So. Later sliding might not be a good uh, option, and uh, you have other options. Now you have free general grab, you have a tunneling, you have a, um, you have a calf, right? And uh, you look at the recession, it's not as um, aggressive, maybe a, a few millimeters. The, this one is even smaller, and this one too. And uh, slightly keratinized tissue, you argue, and um, yeah, and those cases, I usually will start with uh, tunneling. In, this, in those cases, I see how much tissue I can pull. And uh, sometimes this is not bad because, because the amount of keratinite tissue is the limit first for you to advance the flap, actually. I mentioned to you, mucosa is where you get a uh, uh, current advanced uh, uh, capability. So, so here, the keratinized tissue is re relatively narrow. That means you can get to mucosa relatively more easily. So you can release. Sometimes it's easier. Already, okay. So I already show you very quickly. So this is the soft tissue, and after like a 2.5 years, and this was done like a tunneling approach with the connect tissue graft. You you can even see this is some grafting materials underneath and the frenum start to showing up. Now it's blocked by the soft tissue, by your connective tissue. And the patient can clean and it's healthy size, even though there's some recession because this is RT2 recession. We're talking about interproximal uh, bone loss. This is probably, arguably, that's probably the best outcome you can get. Um, this was done by the tunneling already. Okay, in the case three, now we look at a little bit more uh, challenging cases here, and there's 
two recessions, maybe here a little bit. Um, later sliding becomes an issue because you have multiple recessions. Um, other options, you have tunneling or you have the calf. However, as you can see, the vestibule is almost close to nothing here. And then you have, you have frenums, you have the mentalis muscles there. So in those cases, in these kind of these cases, um, uh, is tunneling and the calf is tough. So then we need to think back, maybe we need to compromise aesthetics a bit and uh, you know, trying to do a free general graph here. See, it's running, okay. So the under microscope, you can really control the depth you want to go. And uh, normally you go to the mucogingival junction and you start to split the tissue and the reflect. So again, this is about eight, 10 uh, times of the magnification. And then you can choose to suture your flap epically or in this area where there's not much important anatomical structures, you can just simply excise the mucosa to get the, you know, get the room for your incision. And then you can prepare a little bit here since part of the reason is not only to gain the keratinized tissue, but also to cover the root as well. So theoretically, you want to create some room so that the tissue, soft tissue, can be placed more coronally. Okay. And the harvest, and, and um, very you know, straightforward, and under the scope, and you can see very well where you will harvest. Okay. And there are different ways of harvesting uh, soft tissue in this area, and still, um, autogenous graft is still the to-go um, you know, graft that I use, even though there's some alternatives, especially in this very important area, you don't want to mess around. So autogenous tissue is still important. And then you need to know where the greater plotting is, the bundles you don't want to compromise, and you need to measure. Usually you can go from the distal of a canine to all the way to the second molar, knowing that in the first molar area where the tissue is very thin because the palatal root is right there. And you can control the depth and also the thickness. And you can see there's some adipose tissue. And a lot of times I don't want to say like a fat tissue um, before my, my patient because fat does sounds a little bit uh, interesting. Yeah, so I say adipose tissue. And uh, these are the tissue that you normally encounter. Um, you can you know, release, remove it after, um, after you harvest it. Okay. So this is all done under the microscope in a very controlled way so that we can really handle the tissue quite well. Okay. And do some measurements. And normally the thickness is about one, <coughs> one millimeters roughly. And then you do the suturing here. First you suture uh, the borders so that the tissue can stretch and it can be stabilized very well. And the two hands by manual suturing using the two time forceps. And these are the polypropylene sutures. And once you fixed the interdental and adjacent area, you start to do uh, positioning sutures around the teeth, going back and forth. Okay. So important part is here. You really need to preserve the periosteum. It's a fixed tissue so that you can suture. Under the scope, you can relatively see pretty well and a very good uh, soft tissue control and the bleeding control. So you can really see the periosteum and uh, do the suture this way. Ready. Yep. And normally you put one, two, three, four there. Okay. And one thing good about the bimanual suturing is you can really see your knot if the knot get loose or too tight. Because when you use your fingers to tie the sutures 
and your fingers will be in the way. And then after that, you move patient's lip, length it right up and down to see if the graft move with it. Ideally, you shouldn't see that. Yeah, so these are the procedures. And the three weeks, one year, okay. And uh, apparently it's not an aesthetic uh, outcome because this tissue is like a patched. However, you cover the roots and you push the, you know, the, the frenums and the muscles down. So you increase the vestibular depth. And for this patient, you totally change the prognosis uh, of these, uh, these teeth so the teeth can stay long. And uh, you know, one of the purposes as a periodontist, the beauty of being a, a periodontist is really strive for saving teeth. Not, not to place the titanium implants. I know that's a lot of interest there. However, this is something that we are, this is our mission to save teeth, which is I like the most. You can follow patients over time, three years, so still there. Okay, and this is uh, another case now. Uh, I'm gonna show you, and the patient not interested in ortho anymore, and patient had ortho before. This case, this tooth is facially inclined, that's why there's no bone and uh, the recession is uh, huge there and the tissue again angry, angry tissue there we say and uh, this patient cannot brush very well because it's all mucosa and there's some keratinized tissue and the uh, frenum here. Yeah. Um, and then you look at the papilla, relatively tiny which is always the case and this is more of the RT2 or sometimes maybe even RT3 it really depends on your probing. And the good thing is the papilla here is relatively wide as well, as you can tell. Yeah, so let's pause a little bit and then think. Well, there were four options we mentioned the free general graph, calf, tunneling, and uh, lateral sliding. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so we have a <clears throat> decision yet as a group. Yeah. So this case is a combined approach. <clears throat> Combine lateral sliding and the tunneling in this case. Here again, under the microscope, you see the periosteum, you see the muscle fibers, you see the anatomy very well, and the, to handle this delicate tissue, less than one millimeter in thickness, and you release quite well. And also here, you need to release underneath. This is more like a tunneling as well. <clears throat> and then you put tissue back and then you see, let's play one more time. This is always come with the bony dehiscence on this tooth. You put it back and you stabilize. If not, not in position if with a fibrin and you have to release more. <clears throat> and you prepare the recipient side so that it, because of the papilla is pretty wide there, so it's generally good. And now you start to do the tunneling on adjacent teeth. <clears throat> and tunneling, the good thing about tunneling is you really can see where your instrument is related to the surface so you're not perf the, the performance. <coughs> and here is just the suturing on this side Again, this is a lateral sliding flap, and with the sutures, these are the 7-0 sutures, and these are the tunneling, of course, always coupled with a uh, uh, connect tissue graft underneath so that you can thicken and get a higher chance of the release and uh, the tissue healing. So this is a one-year uh, follow-up. There's some residual, very tiny, if you really want to critique uh, some little tiny recessions remaining 
However, the tissue becomes much healthier and patient can clean very well and the deep vestibule freelances away from, from the site. So this is, can be a very uh, good indication for a microsurgical approach. I think there's one more case. Ha! Huh. Okay, so this is the, probably the last case uh, of the soft tissue. There are more to come in different indications. I mean, I kind of fascinated by you know the the detail, the anatomy that we see here. Um, sometimes this may not be <laughs> super good because that means your tissue is super thin. Yeah. So you see, this is the super super periosteal plexus that. Uh, above, you can even see the bone, and these tissues, you see this uh, some capillaries. That means that the tissue is not happy; it's on the way. You see, this is tissue is so thin; the tissue is on its way to get recession in these tools. Same as here. Here, you probably already have some bone loss. That's why in these tools is more buccally placed. That's why you have some more advanced recession on this tooth. And here you have some recession as well, very slightly, but it's on its way to get recession. And the tissue here also is not, uh, it's a concaved um, a tissue. You can see the bone. Here is prominent and go deep. This is uh, concavity apically. So that's relatively not easy for uh, soft tissue releasing. Okay, so now is our problem now, how we treat uh, this case. <clears throat> Think about it and uh, yeah, the frenum here, the papillus, not happy, very tiny, narrow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the part of my thought process is not only to graph this site, but also since we're already there, then why not to graph the adjacent site as well so that we can prevent the recession here. Okay, already. So this is more of the recent case. I used a different instruments. The blade is 1.25 millimeters. Um, diameter. So this is used for eye surgeries. It's very useful um, for this type of approach already. And then here is another trick here. Um, in cases where I feel like it's harder to get through the tissue, release the tissue from the coronal site, sometimes I will do more of the vista approach from the vertical do a little bit vertical in the mucosa so that I can come from the side way using the tunneling instruments so that I don't traumatize the coronal tissue that's very fragile. Okay. You see, here under high magnification, you can start to realize the tissue is, uh, looks like a thick, right? But this is under microscope and this looks very thin with your naked eyes. So now you navigate, we're talking about the zone three now. So now you're separating your, your flap from the underlying mentalis muscles. This is a detachment approach at the zone three because there's a very tiny zone two there. So once you get through zone one, it's almost like zone three. And the mentalis muscle is right here. Really? and then harvest the soft tissue as well. And this normally is from distal canine all the way to the second molar. And with the thickness about maybe less than one millimeter. And I like to suture the, you know, the, the graft with a the, with the flap so that if you just one suture, they'll be straightforward and easy. And there's a lot of details about how you position the soft tissue and so that you can get a, um, a good position of your soft tissue graft and also the flap. And the, using the two instruments to get a feel for how much tension you put on the soft tissue and uh, do the suture that way. And these are the 7-0 polypropylene sutures. Okay, maybe I can place one more time so that we can 
get fully a uh, sense of how this was done. All right. Let me set things. <clears throat> All right. And uh, my suturing techniques is straightforward. It's tunneling and uh, the, um, the sling suture, basically. So that can take care of a lot of the cases rather than a lot of fancy procedures that are not necessarily very helpful. And uh, these are the things that we practice very almost like every day with our fellows in the Pima. So how we do the predictable sutures. These are the very important, one of the keys of a predictable procedures. And then we, we kind of lock the suture so the suture can be stabilized, the first uh, knot. And the second one is the secure knot suture. And once it's locked and the third one is the secured. Uh, procedure. So this is how it was done, and this was immediately after the procedure that you can see. All right. So you can tell those tissues are very delicate and very hard to navigate and very hard to handle. And uh, with, uh, with the microscope can be relatively uh, more straightforward. Uh, and this is before, yes? Um, with the frenum, how did you...? Yeah, the frenum. Yeah, the frenum? Yeah, frenum, that's a good question, the frenum. I will show you the ultrasound images of the frenum so you can kind of understand why frenum is so hard to release. I mean, the, the best part is the internal, the currently what I do the most is the internal release and with the sharp, instru sharp instruments. So that, uh, for example, the tunneling knife with uh, the spear shape, uh, Orban's knife modified and small enough so it can cut through the muscles and uh, to release it potentially. Yes. Okay, so this is before and after. Looking for the follow ups now. Okay, alrighty. So for the last part, what we discuss about is how we apply the knowledge for the flap releasing and for the flap closure for the soft tissue indications, coupled with the knowledge of the 10 factors that we think about when we choose the techniques. And the, because if you choose the wrong technique, and then it probably won't work very well. And the next one, I will show you important part of the wound stability. We talk about how ultrasound can be helpful for understanding the tissue phenotype. And now we understand how the ultrasound and the microsurgery can be very helpful for understanding the flap design and how we modify the flap design now becomes minimally invasive. And third part, important, is to see how, we can, how important the wound stability is so that we can fully understand how we can improve it. All right, so this is the potential, it's just assuming this is the case with the GBR down and then I put an ultrasound probe right on the top of the, uh, the wound, usually at uh, two weeks or three weeks when the patient first time coming back. And then here's the image that you get, okay? Don't be scared, I will explain to you, all right? And uh, this is the, you know, this is from the acoustic view I mentioned. So this is a lingual flap. And this is a occlusal site. And here is the lingo, there is the buccal, and here is the epical, okay? And uh, this is your incision line on the crestal. And this tissue is really thick on the facial side, that because we pull a lot of tissue to close the wound. And this is the membrane, you see. I highlight here, it is azul, color azul color here and this is the bone. As I mentioned the sound cannot penetrate into bone so what you see is the surface of the bone. Beyond that you see all the black because the sound gets trapped it is like a black hole the sound won't come back so you see that this is the, the bone surface assuming that you place the bone graft there. So that's what you see. And this is the incision line I mentioned. This is the buccal flap. This is the lingual flap because this is the lower posterior area incision line here. This is the thickness of your tissue. All right, everybody follow me? Yeah, very good. You guys smart. 
Very good. Okay, so here is important I will show you now. I use the probe to gently push the wound. This is about maybe about 10, 20 grains. That's the amount of force. And here is the probe uh, uh, gel I put there, a gel pad. So as you can see, this is the lingual bone, the native bone. It's not moving. However, this is your buccal bone particulates. Usually it's an allograph or you put a xenograph there and you push, the bone start to move. You see that? Yeah? And the part of the reason is because you have a little bit incision line opening, so there's some fluid coming into this area. Even though you can see the membrane still intact, but the buccal particulate bone start to move. And this is not necessarily good because when your bone start to move around, that means the bone is not stable. When the particulates start to move as early as uh, 10 days, the particulates bone will start to resorb and then you lose the bone. So that's the importance now, the importance of fixating, the fix the membrane, fix the bone grafts so that the, the wound can be become more stable. So this is imaging that's open my eyes, have let me have a th second thought about the importance of how we can stabilize the bone so that the healing can be more predictable. Apparently, a lot of times we see the soft tissue usually looks okay and there's maybe a little bit opening, but underneath we don't know unless we use technology to look for it at the earlier stage. Okay. okay, so here is another thing about frame name. I'm going to show my day here very well. And this is also published in the paper, uh, accepted, not published yet. So this is a very new information. So I'm really excited to share with you about the frenum. Okay, so again, I use my favorite uh, ultrasound probe and I put in this area, cross-sectional view. So the ultrasound raw information, you can see this is the surface of the soft tissue, and this is the bone. And in between, this is the soft tissue. This is the coronal part, which is here, co close to the papilla. And here is thicker, right? You have a thicker tissue and with some muscles. So this is more the epical. And this is the image here. And it's help you delineate the image and with the uh, calibration here, in here, this is the frenum is here, frenum attachment, show on the clinical. You only see the surface. You don't know what's going on underneath the, the frenum. And this is the bone surface, as I show you. And this is the muscle layer. And this is the mucosa. Mucosa. OK, so here, the beauty of the ultrasound is to show you the video. What I did was, was I pulled patient's lip Gently, because the lip is attached to the frenum. And uh, you will see where the frenum have the impact on the tissue. So this is the frenum. Okay, you can trace it. Let's go all the way up to here. So the videos keep playing. So you can have a better idea. All right. So the, basically, the frenum stop here. It's corresponding to this location. What is more important is where the muscle still pulling. Is that at the surface or in the middle or closer to the bone? That's important because the movement is on the surface very close to the surface. So that has a lot of implication in terms of how we release the frenum. Because unless you really cut it <coughs> and move the whole thing up, there is very challenging to totally release the effect of the muscle pull or frenum pull because the influence is at the surface. A lot of times people propose 
<coughs> internal release. Internal release can have some help, maybe, just to cut here. However, unless you cut all the way up, there's still some pulling from the muscle. Yeah, so this is for me another eye-opening, um, you know, the, the image that I'm really excited to share with you. So once we understand how the freedom works, and then we can possibly figure out a way, try to reduce the negative effect of freedom on coronary advanced flap for soft tissue or for hard tissue evaluation. So this is something I'm interested to share with you. And another um, indication in terms of how ultrasound understand wound healing is based on the two cases, uh, actually the series of cases. I just used two cases as example to show you the differences of the ultrasound images between the two so that we can relate to it and make a clinical, informed clinical decision. As you said, if you see here, as you can tell, we try to do lateral bone augmentation in this case at the baseline, at the molar area. See here, the bone is really thin, even though we didn't release the lingual flap, you can tell there's a concavity here. And also, this is a newly designed uh, flap releasing. I explained to you zone one, zone two, and zone three. This is zone three where you see the periosteum here. <clears throat> and then the flap is quite released. And the five months, this is the amount of bone you gain. So most of you probably will agree this would be you know, the relatively good case because you can place a molar size five millimeter diameter implant here. So at the five months, this looks pretty okay. And from the combing CT, you can tell as well, there's some like a new bone. And also, this is just uh, you know, the example of how you know, we can improve up on this imaging because Combing city don't give you a lot of soft tissue information. It's all black or white. This is all fuzzy. You don't see the soft tissue very well. And even though you get very great bone morphology and you can measure anatomical thickness and the height, you can look at internally, look at the um, bone you gain. Okay, now we look at the soft tissue now. All right. And this is uh, the day 10. You see it's roughly close well and this again this is seven zero sutures. And uh, what is interesting is looking at the ultrasound. Those cases we follow up as early as uh, 10 days. Again this is a crucial view. You can get a sense now. And uh, here is the buckle, here is the uh, lingo, this is the tongue, and this is the bone on the lingo side and this is another piece of the bone particulate surfaces and this is the membrane and this is the soft tissue here. Okay. So relatively what we're looking at is also the, you know, the integrity of the bone. So relatively even though there's a dip, you see this a lot. A lot of times when we graft GBR, we don't get good tissue on the crest. Normally when you get bone, it's about one to two millimeters epically when you start to get the bone thickness, right? So a lot of times we see this. And the part of the reason is because the soft tissue has some pushing pressure on the particulate bone so that you don't get much stability there. That's why at the coronal part, closer to the crystal, you don't get a very good uh, bone. However, you can see relatively you get enough bone width and relatively even though there's a dip and the relatively this is continuous. So this is not a bad healing and you can do a facial scan too. Now this is coronal, this is epical because you have muscle layers here. This is the, your new bone surface. It's roughly curved and uh, it's continuous, you can see. On top, you can almost see this is the membrane here. This is the membrane placed. And on top of the membrane, of course, this is your soft tissue. So no, normally this looks good. And this is the power flow, meaning the blood. And the blood will show the, the golden color. And uh, also there's some artifact here, for example, 
at the interface, you see the golden color as well. So this is an artifact, so don't take that into account. You only look at the soft tissue. This is a mirroring image. This is the soft tissue thickness. So we look at the here. All right, I see there's a video. And uh, you can tell in between, there is an area where there is no color. There's no golden color here. So guess what? That's your incision, your incision line there. So the tissue, the blood flow coming from both ends, from more apical side, and coming to where your incision is made. And uh, apparently it's become important how much the, your blood flow bridging can be important. If your vascular zone or hypo, where there's not much blood fusion, is wider, that meaning the tissue there is suffocating. It's not breathing very well. It might lose the oxygen and start to become necrosis. It will lose the tissue content. That's part of the reason why the tissue start to pull in uh, from one side and you lose the whole uh, flap. So this part is important that we look at that currently we don't have a way to look at. So ultrasound can really look at your blood perfusion here. And you can do a video too. So this is a, a frame, frames of the six seconds. Normally that's how much we record. And then you can see the blood here and the blood there and the stop here. So that's the, the bridging area we necessary need a, a blood there already and also we push again so you see relatively it's it's stable the bone is you know relatively stable even though i explained to you there's a step however this is a newly formed bone and this is a membrane here so relatively fine <clears throat> all right and this is another case, so we can make a contrast, so you can understand the importance of the imaging, the clinical implications. Here, again, this is the defect. This is the molar here, and the premolar here, and the ridge changes from the baseline to the five months. Okay. A little bit gain, but not much, right? Everyone agree, clinically, not much differences. Um, Coming CT shows similar information. So basically the bone at uh, one millimeter crestal is about three and uh, three millimeter, five millimeter is about seven and the nine millimeters. So it's not much differences. So uh, apparently clinical evaluation, this is not, not a good case. You can see at day 10, there's a little bit fibrin line. It's a little bit open in there. And from the acoustic view, you can already tell this is the lingual flap. And this is the buckle. In between, there is a gap. And this is the suture, the white reflection of the suture. And this is the old bone. <clears throat> and then this is the new particulate bone. It's already epically positioned. I don't know if you see this. Normally, the bone should have been here. And this is about three, four millimeters down already. So apparently there's an apical movement. It's like a lens sliding. You have the rain and the water and there's the mud just going down to the valley from the mountains. So this is the mountain and the antis and there's something happening here. So that goes apically. And power's uh, color flow showing similar too. This is the area, the bridging area is a little bit far away and from the facial is more apparent too i mean do you remember the last case where there's a nice bone morphology very bright line and on top of that there's a membrane however on this case you can see some like a scattered structures the brightness here those are the particles that under the ultrasound looks like and you don't see a clear line you even see there's a break line here. That's because you have the incision line slightly opening here. So the fluid coming into this area and the disrupt your bone particulates here. 
So this is the bomb particles and the not really look nice, right? It looks like angry. Yeah, so this is the facial image that you see and this is the power again. Already. And we did some analysis. We had about 20 cases now and uh, look at the 10 days. Remember, 10 days, that's as early that we saw. And uh, we had a wound closure and we had um, you know, the wound stability as a part of the equation. So normally zero means when there is a wound open. When there is, we see there is a line at 10 days under ultrasound and under, the, under ultrasound actually. And you can see this is uh, scattered. Those individual dots, meaning that each case that we evaluate. So you have one here, this vertical axis, meaning the amount of horizontal bone gain. Those cases were for horizontal bone computation. So eight millimeters gain, even though you have opening, it's, we code it as zero. And the, for the majority of the part, it's like losing bone even. In some cases, there's no bone gain. So those are the, the bad cases, basically. We spread them into bad cases. And here, this wound closure, meaning that apparent closure from the ultrasound. You can see you get more consistent results now. Those cases usually get a few millimeters of bone gain and without any cases with the bone loss. And there's a correlation, meaning that if you see at 10 days already, you have closure, clinical closure, or under the uh, ultrasound, then you have a better chance to gain horizontal bone. Comparing to here, it's over the place. Again, that's what I meant, predictability. And uh, here, you don't have good predictability. It's go over the place. And another question interesting is you might ask, we all know the primary closure is important, right? Importante. And then how come there's some cases, even though you have some wound closure problem, the wound get open, how come there's still some cases you get some bone gain? Yeah, interesting. Even though there's a high, like a six, seven millimeters. Yeah, of course, these are the outliers, may not apply to all the cases, but this make me wonder, there are other reasons behind it. So maybe the opening is not a, a primary determinant factor. There's something that's more important. <clears throat> so the bone stability is the answer. Yeah, yeah. Because again, I look at the bone stability, look at the continuity of the bone on the ultrasound. <clears throat> and they classify the cases into zero, meaning the bone looks ugly, it's irregular, and there's some mm, scattered bone particles, not stable bone. And the bone stability one, I call it one for all the cases, whereas I see a continuous line, like a first case, beautiful cases. And then there's a regression, higher regression. So the R squared is 0.58. So meaning a lot of the variabilities can in terms of the bone gain. So that's our primary outcome. Horizontal bone loss is determined by how stable the bone graph is. Right. So that's kind of important that I learned from those cases is that bone stability might be more important than the wound opening. Of course, we need to get primary closure. However, if your wound is stable to begin with, even though you might have some wound opening, maybe that can overcome the deficiencies of a wound opening. You still can get some uh, bone gain. So that's the uh, importance of uh, understanding of the wound healing so that we can apply the knowledge to your private practices now. So uh, these are the very new data that I'm really excited to share with you. And, um, you know, ultrasound again, and uh, for periodontal phenotype evaluation is the first thing. And second thing is really change how we design the flat for current events, the flat for soft tissue and hard tissue regeneration for the studies as well. And also to monitor the wound healing. Can you imagine that at 10 days, we can already think about what will happen at five months. Yeah, so then during that period, the window, then we can decide. Now we understand 
then we can decide how to improve or how to prevent or how to implement so that we don't need to wait at five months and start to open up and say, sorry, I don't have enough bone and we have to start over. So that's a five month waiting. So that's the, the beauty of uh, you know, the research here I wanna show you. Okay, so let me see how much um, time we have and I wanna show you, still have some time, right? Yeah, I wanna show you some um, cases too, so that we can not fully utilize the time. Okay, as I mentioned, <clears throat> we, we as a periodontist, it's, it's a mission for us really trying to save teeth. And not only periodontists, we as a dentist, endodontists, restorative doctors, prosthodontists, periodontists, we, we want to save teeth and also want to save implants as well. Now, nowadays, a lot of complications coming in. It's really tough, very sad. However, that's the reality. And uh, if we have a way to preserve dentition and we can position ourselves better so that we can help our patients more. And those are the cases I wanna show you. For example, this second molar, number 217 in our system, yeah. And then you see here, just showing the x-ray, you can immediately tell the suffocation involvement and there's radiolucency, and this so you lose some bone as well. In this case, not necessarily have a good prognosis. Everyone agree. And uh, this case was originally referred for extraction and uh, maybe later placed in the implant. But um, we want to push for you know, saving the teeth so that we can have a better way to save the teeth. Again, under the microscope, and you did the incision, reflection, and the debridement, then you can really see this solely here, the calculus in the mirror. So once you see, again, back to our early discussion, the visual sense and tactile sensation now come into place using the cavitrons, you were able to remove the etiology that caused the periodontal attachment loss. And you can really go into the distal vacation that you normally don't see. And you can remove the aggression tissue even and then you start to realize the bone of topography relatively you know, easy, this uh, circumferential defect, you can place the bone graph you like and then place the membrane here and now you see the periosteum and this is the control, the release and the seven zero sutures under the high magnification you can see your incision line close up with the seven zero sutures here and the there and the interiorly as well and it's 24 months. Even though you still have vacation issues on the x-ray, but the prognosis significantly improved f two years out into this treatment and tissue looks healthy, no probe in depth, even though this is, uh, can be improved. There's uh, a little bit uh, overhanging here, but this is the case that can really, you feel happy at the end of the day you're really helping the patients rather than extraction and you have to do maybe sinus augmentation, placing the implant and with a questionable prognosis. This case is more severe already and uh, probably most of us was thinking about extraction as well immediately. So a lot of times don't be um, misled by x-ray too. X-ray is only 2D, and a lot of times we need to think about biology and also you know, clinical evaluation as well. But apparently, you have significant amount of bone loss, no doubt of, of it. And even there's some endoperial lesion as well, you can tell. Um, however, I test the tooth, there's vitality is still vital. Um, and here, vacation involvement in the proximal bone loss. And uh, one thing I check 
very closely is the mobility, the tooth mobility. If the tooth is not much mobile, if there's a Miller class one mobility, there's still a chance for regeneration. Great Miller class two, meaning less than one millimeter and mobility, and then you need a splinting. When there's a three, then most of the time you don't have a choice. You might have to extract. Okay, so this tooth, all right, I decide to go, you know, like a cowboy and um, decide to you know, do debridement and uh, place the bone grafts here. And you know you're not going to cover this is because this is through and through. So you place the bone where to the adjacent crestal bone and they place the membrane there just as a you know, barrier. And here is the mesial side after the debridement, the mesial side. You also put a membrane there. This side under high magnification, so you can really see. All right, so it's 50 months into the procedure, as expected, it's always will have a vacation involvement. A patient can maintain, maintain the area relatively well, and the tooth is still there at the 50 months in, and there's some evidence of bone you know, feel. So that's the beauty of you know, as a periodontist here. And this is another extreme case was sent to me for extraction. There's a perioendo lesion and the root canal done. This is the combing CT. Not, not much bone left, not much mobility, maybe because of the distal still have a bone. So under the microscope, you see this is a residual bone. And uh, then you can see the root surface quite well. It's the root surface. This is the flap reflection. So you can clean the area very well under the microscope. It's a high magnification, close to 20, 20 times. Right. And use the, the tunneling instruments at the angle so that you can pull the tissue very gently. And this is the incision closure. And the baseline in 12 months, there's some evidence of the radio radio radiographic bone filling here. Yeah, so that's the excitement as a you know, dentist, that how much we can achieve. Because without the treatment, what else can you do? Extraction, maybe a bridge or implants, those are not necessarily the best uh, uh, indication. And here is another case, originally the huge bone loss and the probing depth this is easily 11 millimeter probing depth there. And with the pus formation and the frenum, now you learned it's really difficult. So if you don't have to reflect here, don't. Because once you reflect the free the frenum, frenum will pull. Okay, under the microscope, this is a three millimeter small mirror. You see calculus that you don't normally see. So those, the, those are the key elements. Identify the etiology so that you can really clean the area well, give it a chance for regeneration. Okay. Yeah. And you check and you see there's still like a calculus there. And also you can check to see if there's a crack line. Because when there's a vertical fracture, it's done. There's nothing you can do. If there's not, great. And also you can appreciate the bone topography there. It's really, you know, even though you lose part of the buccal plate, but you still have an interproximal bone and the lingual bone. So that can be amenable for bone graft. And the placing it and the releasing the flap, I use the tunneling knife working on the zone three. Again, very gently because you're not adding crazy bone there, so here. <clears throat> and these are the tiny little seven zero sutures. You approximate your flaps well, and also you enter, this is the sling sutures, so that you can adapt your flap onto the incisor. 
these are the, you know, the beauty of the, the micro approach. And the before and after, of course, you have some recession. There's nothing you can do. And then maybe later you can place a soft tissue graph there if the patient is interested in the higher um, um, aesthetic outcome. And especially here is white papilla. You might have a chance, but this is the amount of bone you can gain from here up to here. Right, so it's pretty well. Okay, and the final couple cases for implantitis. This is important as well. We're not only saving uh, teeth, but also saving the implants now. Uh, this is a case by Dr. Rafael Siquela. And so now he's the program director at the VCU, Virginia Commonwealth, who was my resident at that time at the Michigan. Probing and these implants, how many of you will start to think about extraction? Probably most of us, right? Me too. I was thinking about extraction as well. But this case was immediately placed very close to the canine. Uh, yeah, as a patient, you know, trying the error, trying to save the implant, we push the limit and see how much we can get. Right? And this is the blood flow, ultrasound, meaning that this is another blood flow imaging showing that the tissue is angry, a lot of blood flow into the soft tissue corresponding to the bleeding and probing here. And uh, under the, the scope, you're able to clean the areas pretty well. And also importantly, you need to see the bone wall. That's probably one of the most important part when you try to uh, repair per implant lesion. You see if this is surrounded, then usually means that you have a better chance for regeneration compared to if you lose the buccal and the lingual bone. It's already high, then there's less chance. And also the surface treatment as well. So this is a 14 month, the implant is still there. So it's still good. <clears throat> okay, so this is the last case I show you here. And uh, this is a Nobel implant, external hex, and place implant for 10 years with a severe bone loss. You don't know where the buccal plate is on the 2D X-ray. And you don't know where the lingual bone is. That's the beauty of using the ultrasound. And the combing CT may not help you a lot because once you have an implant, you have a scattering here. Here it's really important to show you the importance of high magnification. All of a sudden you see the calcified deposit on the implant surfaces that you normally don't see. This is a 30x, 30 magnification. And when you see it, you have a chance to remove. It really depends on the size of the scalar that you use. And this is a contaminated oxygen layer, titanium oxide layer. And you see these all the little particles these are the titanium particles that my influence have a foreign body reaction. Okay, sorry about the, the motion because this is a high magnification. You get, you get some dizziness here. Okay. So this is how important we talk about the visual and tactile feeling under the microscope. And that's the, you know, the amount of debris that we can bring to this implant and to give it the potential for healing. And one thing important is even though you lose the buccal plate, one important thing is you need to see where the lingual plate is. Because the lingual plate determines how much bone you can come back. That's the limit. If the bone is, if the area is supra bony, meaning this area, there's no chance, currently the technology is not there yet, no chance you can grow the bone back. The best you can get is where the lingual plate is. If the lingual plate is down here, the same level of the buccal plate, that's tough, there's no chance you can get. And interproximal bone usually is higher because adjacent to is holding the bone. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, remember I mentioned to you the importance of stability, the wound stability. Nowadays, for most of the cases, I fix the membrane now with the tags so that the bone graft won't go apical. 
and also suture to the adjacent fixed tissue with the 6070 sutures. So the membrane can be firmly protecting the bone grafts. When stability, again, important. And suture around. Suture on the other side, so you really stretch your membrane very well. So that's the way to, you know, to gain uh, stability here. All right. And again, this is probably the key information I want to share with you is with the high magnification. These structures are not nature. They come with the infection. And uh, the calculus, sometimes it's the dead bone, necrotic bone. On the surface, there is tons of bacteria, I can guarantee you. Without removing the, those um, deposits, it's very hard to get, get bone closure. It's before and after and suturing. We can take you know, another five hours talking about the suturing and whether you close or not. We can talk about that next time. In the three weeks, there's opening, which is fine, which is normal. Most of the time, you get opening. Eight weeks, you see this. Twelve weeks, yeah. So ultrasound, you can follow up. Baseline, three weeks, eight weeks, twelve weeks. What you see is here is a normal uh, implant. You see the threads corresponding to here. And this is the inflammation zone where you lose the content. It becomes shadow. And now you have the bone particles because what is beyond the implant is where you place the bone grafts, right? So when you see the bone graft, the sound bounces back. So when you're not seeing the implant, usually it's a good thing. Usually it's a good thing. Three weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks, you still see bone. And you see part of the implant here. This is the platform corresponding to here and this part is here. So beyond that, you still see bone, so which is good at 12 weeks. And the blood flow, you see there's a, a lot of blood flow. The two colors all means blood flow. And three weeks start to narrow, to, to taper down. At eight weeks, at 12 weeks, go back to baseline. That usually the inflammation, chronic inflammation. In three weeks, they pass the inflammatory phase and now go back to the natural, the, the uh, <coughs> remodeling phase. And you see this is the three month follow up. There was no bone here and with the two fixation pins on each side of implant, more apical part to hold the bone. And you see there's some bones start to consolidate at three months. So this is a nice healing here, All right? So, <coughs> At the end, what I want to convey is really we use the microsurgery approach using the technology microscope and the using the ultrasound. Really need to understand the understand the wound healing, the science, and the art part, and the, with our hands and with our visions, and really can augment our capability of regenerative procedures for soft tissue and hard tissue. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and the really great opportunity for me to be here. Thank you again, and uh, I'm ready for your questions, if you may have. Gracias.
Mm -hmm. But how do you start out at the upper part? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And before I answer, I would like to thank you for Diego's uh, translation. Really appreciate. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Yeah, so back to the question. Um, <clears throat> depends. Depends the needs, and the, if possible, especially for uh, PTFE membrane, polytetrafluoroethylene membrane, it's non resorbable membrane. And we know when the membrane moves and irritate the soft tissue, and you get wound opening very commonly. So for those type of membranes, if possible, I will pin the membrane on the lingual side as well. And in that case, you really need to reflect the lingual flap. If you look at the uh, cases, a lot of my cases, um, it's a decision between reflection or not. And um, because you, when you reflect, that means you irritate the interface between the soft tissue and the hard tissue. And the, the body will take more time to repair. So the current concept is if you don't really need to reflect, you reflect less and the healing tends to be faster. That comes to the downside, meaning that if you really need to reflect, for example, if you need to take, take the lingual side and then I have to reflect. Yeah, see, so that's the, the decision making that we have to decide. First, I will not reflect, only if I need, then I reflect the lingual side and I tag. If the lingual side is tight, meaning the adjacent teeth are very close, and uh, usually the wound is not as huge, like multiple, it's only one teeth, uh, edentulous area, single gap, then the wound is relatively small in size, and uh, I normally will suture using a 7-0 suture, suture the membrane to the lingual flap too, and bite a little bit more epical where the flap is stable. So that way I can stabilize my coronal part. So basically there are two ways. One is using the pins, and the other one is to use 7-0 sutures yeah, to stabilize the membrane. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. <coughs> Muchas gracias, doctor, por la charla. Excelente. Gracias. Tengo una voz con respecto a un caso clínico que mostró, eh, donde había un molar con compromiso <coughs> endodontal, eh, y luego el, el molar no fue tratado odonticamente. Me gustaría saber si hay algún motivo por el cual no se realizó un en ese molar, y si es estable en el tiempo. So, <laughs> I try to, yeah. She asked it yeah. in the case <coughs> you have the endoperial ah, reaction. See. You took the vitality and you see, said. See, see, yes. And uh, the question is. It's why don't you did the endo? Ah, uh, see, see. Why don't you yeah, that? so you mentioned to the, the case that the perio endo uh, lesion. Yeah, yeah. So the, which, let me see which one. And normally, maybe just uh, in general, right, we do the vitality test. And uh, normally we'll refer to the endodontist too, to have them evaluate. And uh, there's no vitality issues. Normally the endodontist in the US at least won't do the root canal treatment. Then if that's the case, I will start my periodontal treatment, assuming there's no endo problem. But at the same time, that's a great question, I forgot. I always tell the patient, because from the old studies, there's a very slight chance when we treat the periodontal lesion, especially close to the apex, then there's a slight chance the tooth will become devitalized. My, the, the nerve might die. So in that case, I always explain to the patient when there is still endodontic lesion, meaning throbbing pain or a lingering pain, and the high sensitivity, then at that point, we do the endodontic treatment. See? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the current uh, practice we have there. Yeah? Thank you. Gracias. <coughs> Thank you. 
Gracias, doctor Chan. Me sumo Gracias. a las felicitaciones de mis otros colegas. Eh, usted ha presentado un seguimiento desde la reflexión, la investigación científica, el fundamento de la evidencia, la técnica, los procedimientos, los recursos tecnológicos. Eh, siendo el paciente un, un soporte muy importante, eh, ustedes han podido evaluar o valorar la percepción que los pacientes que han recibido este tipo de tratamientos quirúrgicos eh, les resulta más confortable, menor dolor, operatorio menor. ¿Cuál es la percepción del paciente desde el punto de vista cualitativo? I try to get the help from Diego. Yeah, sorry. Did you understand? No. <laughs> uh, she asks if the uh, perception of the patient with all these treatments and all the technology, mm -hmm. the use of the microscope and the microsurgery, ah, uh, si, si. like si. a perception of the patient si. in general. Yeah. In general, yes. The question was about the perception, patient's perception, perception. Yeah. So. Patient, yes. The patient, yeah. Um, we don't have um, much clinical evidence from this type of uh, um, patient-centered outcomes. However, from the personal experiences treating patients, like uh, hundreds of uh, patients with uh, microsurgery, one of the things most of my patients mention about is the, the, the minimally invasive nature of this type of approach and also the minimal discomfort, pain from this type of approach. So that's encouraging, even though this anecdotal, meaning there's not evidence-based, but that's the common comments that I receive from my patients as well. Yeah. Thank you. Gracias. Yeah. But uh, uh, I would like to know uh, what is your experience about the laser interview? Yeah, um, we have different types of lasers uh, in the clinics. Like, for example, the dial laser and ND -ERC lasers, ERIAC lasers, and the CO2 lasers. Um, really depends on the, the indications, right? And also, unfortunately, the current evidence is not. Um, very positive in terms of using lasers for treating peritonitis or treating implants. Unfortunately, maybe there's a little effect of reducing the BOP from the current consensus for using lasers, but there's no um, good evidence for that. And you can quite understand why. I can kind of try to explain to you why laser may not um, work the way it should be. Yeah, a lot of uh, laser studies look at the soft tissue wound healing. It can stimulate the wound healing very well, but we um, maybe deviate a little bit. We use the laser to remove the heart tissue calculus or remove um, the bacteria that way. And uh, the laser point is very tiny, less than one millimeter. So you can assume in that you want to treat the whole implant surfaces using the laser points. Unless you have the medium, for example, you might put a water as a medium that can transmit the energy so you can break potentially using the energy from the laser to the water and the water evaporate and to disrupt the calculus on the root surface or on the implant surface it's really difficult because you need to go through all the layers. Currently, the protocol is maybe using the laser as a wand to just go through about 10 seconds and then you treat the perimpantitis, which is not that easy. And usually for implant surface treatment using the cavitron takes a easily like a 30 minutes. Yeah, so that's uh, you know, one reason why laser may not work very well, okay. yeah. Uh, doctor, uh, do you treat the surface before the bone graft? Do you treat like with the medical thing like arresting? 
arresting. Uh, for yeah, arresting. That's the minocycline, right? Yeah. yeah. For what kind of cases? Yeah. Soft tissue. The number the second case that you show, uh, I think it was the... Soft tissue or heart... Exactly. It was like uh, the 23, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the three, three, four, something... Yeah. Like um, the, the concept really in the back to the 70s, 80s for the, the soft yeah. conditioning, root conditioning, is to open up the dentinal tubules so that potentially the collagen fibers can readapt to the root surface and potentially can have a better healing outcome in terms of the root coverage or for heart tissue regeneration. Um, there's some like positive evidence on the preclinical studies, for example, animal studies, rat studies, monkey studies, dog studies. Unfortunately, there is no differences in humans clinically. Yeah, from Dr. Uh, Mariotti's like uh, review articles back into 2000, maybe early 2000, it's already um, you know show that unfortunately there's now additional benefits. However, I know still some clinicians will do that. I just feel a little bit safer. You treat the surface with some chemicals, you feel a little bit safer that way. You feel like a peace in mind. However, in terms of uh, clinical outcomes, unfortunately, probably not very evident. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Charles. Thank you for the time. Uh, my question is, what's your opinion about the surface treatment of implants? About the last case of Yeah, the last the treatment. Yeah, yeah. So uh, currently, for me, um, the most important thing is again to see, to see the surface, and that's the first thing. Once you you can tell the surface is contaminated with the high magnification, then you can implement ways to treat, which will be the techniques that you're referring to. There are many ways to treat the surface. Currently, people just uh, you know, throw everything we can to treat the surface. Right? You're using a titanium brush, you use the airflow, you're using um, hand instruments, power instruments, those kind of things, and the chemical as well. And uh, currently, what I do is really using Cavitron to remove the calcified tissue that is attached to the root implant surface and not only in the valleys, but also on the top and the down, and I remove the crown so I can see 360 degrees and clean very well. And after that, you can use the airflow just to polish, ablate the surface to remove the loosely attached um, calculus and the plaque. So that's the only two things I do. Some people propose implantoplasty using the high speed to remove the threads. And uh, commonly, I don't do that for a couple of reasons. First, you increase the amount of titanium particles at the wound, even though you might be able to put um, the, the, the wax, or some people put a rubber dam there in order to reduce the titanium powders. But still, there, there is just powder. And the secondary, I don't really fully appreciate is the surface treatment after your plasti is unknown. How would you realize, how do you confirm that the surface after your, your roughening with the high speed and with the different burrs would be better than before? So that's another thing I don't like. So one thing I would probably apply is after the treatment, when there is a tissue recession and then when there's a part of the implant that's exposed in the oral cavity, and also when the patient cannot clean very well, so there's a plaque always on the implant surface and start to affect the soft tissue look, inflammation, then that's the time when I might consider plasti at that point. 
So that's how I approach currently. And we see so many uh, videos using a titanium brush. That's something you need to be careful if you're using a titanium brush is you see the residual fibers that you don't normally see using the, the loops. So those fibers can be a foreign body. So that's part of the reason you might not be able to get regeneration. So that's the problem that we see because those fibers are not firmly attached to the, the bristle. And once you get the rotation and the, you, you lose the fibers in the wound that you don't want to lose. Yeah, so that's the important part. This is Thank you. Maybe we should. Thank you. Just. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan, and gracias a todos.